All right, we are ready to go, Mr. Deputy Warden. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so welcome everyone to County Council, August 13th, 2020. Uh, I will ask the clerk uh, uh, to do a roll call, please. Thank you, Deputy Warden Hicks. I have all members in attendance, except for Councillors Gamble and Body. We have Councillor Thomas joining us on behalf of Councillor Body. Thank you. So uh, does anyone have any declaration of pecuniary interest? I see no raised hands, Madam Clerk. Okay, then we'll move on. If one does uh, arise during the course of the meeting, I would ask you to declare it at that time. Uh, next is item number four, adoption of minutes. Um, and those are the minutes of County Council and Committee of the Whole dated July 23rd, 2020. Uh, that is moved by Councillor Potter and seconded by Councillor Keaveney. Do we have any discussion of those sets of minutes? I don't see any hands. Then I'll call the question. All those in favor? Oh, sorry, we should be saying any opposed, right? <laughs> any opposed? I'm going to say that that is carried. Thank you very much. We have no requirement for a closed uh, meeting. And item number six is a report. First of all, uh, Board of Health, Health Minutes dated June 26th, uh, 2020. Um, that will be moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor O'Leary. Is Dr. Era present, Madam Clerk? Um, no, I don't think he is. I'm, I'm wondering if Councillor Patterson could um, provide an overview. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Uh, yes, this is an update from Dr. Era. The health unit continues to have full control over the outbreak in Gray and Bruce counties. As of yesterday, August 12th, there were five active cases, zero cases currently uh, hospitalized, zero deaths, and zero facilities in outbreak. Uh, the health unit has been working with all schools in Gray and Bruce to ensure safe reopening. And uh, Dr. Era is meeting every two weeks with the executive from all schools. Uh, there's been increased reports of international visitors failing to self quarantine. So the health unit is working with local police services and the enforcement section of the Public Health Agency of Canada with regards to management and follow up to ensure compliance. Workplace testing is underway and this data will be collated and analyzed as a feasibility study to optimize the process to break the chain of transmission. And as far as I know, so far it's only been uh, Bruce Power and Chapman's. So they will get some good data from that. Uh, they're receiving quite a few reopening plans and they are reviewing them to help uh, businesses and organizations to open up. The health unit's infectious disease team continues uh, with case and contact management, reporting and responding to COVID related calls. Contact tracing exceeds provincial targets with 100% of all cases contacted within 24 hours. So that's really good news. And on top of all of that, the health unit team continues to ensure essential uh, public health activities not related to COVID-19, ensuring that they're delivered uh, safely and effectively. And uh, I do happen to have a bookmark that lists all the essential services of uh, public health, which was pretty funny. I was reading a book and there it was, but I'm not gonna read all those <laughs> services. I think people are aware of what public health does. So, and if there's any questions, I can try and answer them or get back to you with the answers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Are there any questions at all on these uh, on this report? I do not see any. So then I will call the question. Are there any opposed? Seeing none, I will say that that also is carried. We'll move to item number seven, which is uh, adoption of a bylaw, um, 5090, a bylaw to update the fees and service charges for the County of Gray. Um, that is moved by 
uh, Councillor Woodbury and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Any discussion on uh, this item? Seeing none, then again, I'll call the question. Is there anyone opposed? And again, seeing none, I will say that has, that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we turn next to item number eight, good news and celebration. Uh, so <clears throat> we will start, uh, why don't we start with Chatsworth? And thank you, uh, Deputy Warden Hicks and good morning County Council. Um, not a lot to report. Uh, I'd like to uh, certainly extend our appreciation to the uh, provincial and federal governments for the announcement yesterday in regards to the emergency COVID funding for all of our municipalities. It's certainly gonna be helpful. Um, we are planning to go uh, back to in-person council meetings in September uh, with virtual participation from the, uh, the public. So I kind know of council's looking forward to that. And I think I'll end there. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Yes, thank you, Councillor Mackey. Uh, Councillor Gamble, oh, he's uh, not present, right? Madam Clerk? Correct, sorry, oh. I was on mute. <laughs> no problem. Next, then we'll turn to uh, Georgian Blots. Um, Councillor Broley? Thank you, uh, Deputy Warden. Um, we're still living the dream in Georgian Bluffs. Um, we had our first council meeting in chambers last night, which was great to have it happen again. A uh, different world when you get back in your council chambers with council versus uh, video. Uh, well received, uh, tried something different and uh, with no hitches, thanks to our staff. Uh, I must say my favorite topic to the international airport, uh, our flights are up, have surpassed last year's at the same time, even during the COVID, which is quite amazing when you stop and think about it. Uh, the other thing too, just amazing, which just shows you how great our staff are working, is that our fuel sales are the cheapest in Ontario. And that's quite amazing when you stop and think about it. Uh, all other airports uh, are not uh, as fortunate as what the uh, Wharton Kempler International Airport is, but we're really looking for business. Thank you. Water's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Burley. It's always nice to hear that flights are up. Sorry, that's about as funny as I'll get this morning. <laughs> Councillor Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Warden, and good morning to everyone in Council. Uh, the good news I have is that just in time for us to go back into actual meetings in Council Chambers, I finally get high-speed internet with fiber optic that Bell has just put in in the section of township I live in, so it's nice having that. So that's my good news today. Very good, thank you, Councillor Carlton. I'll turn next to Gray Highland. Is uh, our warden still with us? Yes, I am. Oh, and, yeah. okay. uh, just a quick update. I will uh, mirror the comments from the uh, mayor of Chatsworth. It's great to see that we are receiving those funds throughout the municipalities of Gray County and as the Gray County itself for COVID uh, related uh, expenses. Um, certainly, we are all moving forward to AMO's conference next week for those that are attending. That's, uh, it looks like it's going to be a, a, full, a full agenda. And with, uh, I think we've been quite uh, uh, successful in our uh, request for having delegations. From a Grey Highlands perspective, uh, we are in the process. Uh, our office is, uh, we're going to have 50% of our staff coming back around the 17th of August. Uh, some staff are, are back now. We're in the process of having our front counter uh, reconstructed to include uh, plexiglass so we can eventually open up to the general public. Currently at this time, uh, with the, where we are located in the base part of Gray Gables, uh, we are using one of the um, windows uh, that's sort of under a canopy that we're, we're uh, addressing public through that way, which is working out fairly well. We're People can come up to the window and then we can have that interaction with the staff that are there. And so slowly uh, moving back into that uh, process. Interesting enough, I've had a, a contact from a, a, a hockey uh, parent uh, who's also in, uh, the president of the Osprey Minor Hockey with questions about how we're going back to uh, hockey and our arenas and I'm sure other uh, municipalities are also going to be talking about that as well so I'm sure our staff are talking to other staff on that but 
you know, there are guidelines that he's forwarded to me with regards to uh, OMHA's uh, rules and regulations. So if you haven't uh, had a chance to see those, that's probably a good good start in the sense of what OMHA is uh, um sort of laying out for their use of uh, those players and staff. And it's, it's interesting. They're talking about uh, each arena having a, a bubble of 50 and those kids stay in that arena. They don't move around to other arenas. So there, you know, so there's some going to be some big changes there. And, and uh, so at this point, that's about all I have to update other than lots of traffic around. And uh, certainly uh, summer has been a great summer and uh, a few weeks left to enjoy. So thank you, Mr. Deputy Ward. Thank you for that update, Mr. Warden. Uh, Councillor Desai, anything to add? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Warden. Uh, just a couple of things to add. Uh, first one uh, being that uh, uh, we, we have uh, the Fever Shem Kinsman who are trying to work on a um, on a drive-in movie night uh, at the Fever Shem Park. And it's, uh, it's really heartening to see um, uh, to, to see a group sort of try and continue to fundraise towards their mandate uh, despite the restrictions of COVID. Um, I, I, I'm hoping they can uh, get the event put together and I wish them all the success for that. Um, second, I also have it on good authority from our uh, uh, Grey Highlands clerk, who is without question uh, the only redeeming part of the township of Southgate, uh, that Grey Highlands could return to uh, uh, in-person council meetings as early as um, uh, October. And I'm really looking forward to that. It's been a whole summer of not wearing a suit and tie. And um, quite frankly, t-shirt and shorts puts me out of my element. So um, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, of course, I'm also looking forward to uh, hopefully being back in county council chambers soon. And uh, seeing all of you uh, again after quite a while. And that'll be it for me. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Gordon. Thank you, Councillor Design. You're looking very sharp in your suit and tie, at least on the picture that I see. Nice shot. <laughs> uh, turning next to the Town of Hanover, um, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Deputy Warden, and good morning, County Council. In Hanover, we're still living the dream, but I'm borrowing a new tagline. It's always sunny in H-Town. I read that in <laughs> uh, the virtual fall fair hosted by the Hanover Bentic Brandt Agricultural Society was a success and well received. I'm always amazed at how creative people are. And uh, just a little note, uh, if you're in Hanover and take a drive by P&H Milling, they're constructing six new silos for their operation, four are up and two to go. And it's pretty amazing to see those big silos go up. We have one gas station that's being reconstructed and it was leveled in two days. Again, those big machines come in and it's down. Uh, another gas station has opened up at the south end of Hanover. So those residents will be very happy and anyone coming through Hanover at the south end will be pleased. We've got a quite, quite a few projects happening in Hanover, including a new subdivision, a sidewalk, a new sidewalk near the, near the senior high school and reconstruction of a couple of streets. So that's what's happening in Hanover. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. We'll move next to Mayford and uh, Councillor Clumpus. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Warden, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just a quick update from us. Um, things are very busy here in, in Meaford. Traffic is heavy, as I'm sure it is everywhere. People are on the move this summer. Memorial Park campsite is full. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your, uh, your little stay with us, uh, Deputy Warden. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, shoreline parks are uh, under reconstruction, so that's a very welcome sight to see uh, playground equipment and stuff being uh, being put back into its usable form again. Um, beaches are open. Uh, people are being very responsible on the beaches, which I'm happy to see, but it's wonderful to see the kids being kids out playing as they should be uh, without a care in the world um, uh, in the water over the summer. Um, I'm interested in everyone's uh, perspective about uh, moving out of uh, the um, uh, emergency status and look forward to the discussion with uh, the county's emergency control group on that next week. Um, it's uh, certainly come to our attention and we're looking at it 
I must admit to being a, a little concerned about um, being cautious until we have some sense of how the return to school is going to be managed and uh, uh, what effect that will have on our vulnerable populations. And uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, um, I'm ready to leap into uh, progressing as much as we all are looking forward to um, seeing each other uh, alive and, and well um, around the council table and with um, uh, our public being uh, much more engaged. But I think, uh, I think this could be a challenge for us until we are, are, have some better sense of uh, how our school back into entry is, is going to be managed. Um, so look forward to that discussion next week. And I think um, that said, I know the businesses are, are attracting uh, uh, folks downtown and that's a good thing. Our patios are busy. Uh, so we're enjoying summer. Thanks everyone. Thank you, uh, Councillor Clumpus. And it was nice to have that cameo appearance as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My husband, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, next we'll turn to Councillor Keeveny. Thank you, Deputy Warden Hickson. Good morning, County <clears throat> Council. And just a couple of things to add. Uh, and perhaps some of you saw a recent article on uh, Facebook from mayameca.com. And uh, in that uh, entitled, The 17 Best Small Towns to Visit on Ontario, Meaford was named and we're very proud of that. Meaford was dubbed the little sister of Collingwood, but with better genetics. I really like that line. <laughs> Our beautiful harbor, beautiful Joe Parker mentioned along with Grandma Lambs and the Irish Mountain Lookouts. So that was uh, a special highlight this week. Um, our farmer's market has returned to an in-person market. This past Friday, they had six vendors. And I know that they got great reviews from the uh, health unit in how they managed uh, the market. And this week, there will be more vendors. And those mark vendors that are there, are, it's, it's all food this year. So the, uh, and besides that, we have uh, farm gate markets everywhere. Whether you drive down the seventh line, the ninth line, 15, 16 are are sort of our main country roads. There are just little farm markets at uh, many gates and they're uh, uh, selling their corn and their fresh produce and it's, and it's great and people are really enjoying those and uh, you can almost get a meal by uh, touring around to those markets. So that is uh, pretty much it for uh, what's going on in Meaford. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Keaveney. We're gonna to turn to the city of Own Sound and uh, Mayor Body's not here. So we'll, uh, Councillor Thomas. Councillor Thomas, you're on mute still. Well, it was working that way earlier. Sorry about that. Thanks, Deputy Warden. Um, lots going on in the city of Owen Sound. I guess uh, the nearest and dearest development to my heart is we finally got the Owen Sound and North Gray Union Public Library open to the public this uh, Tuesday. And uh, things are going very well. Uh, people don't need to use... Uh, curbside pickup for their books any longer. And I know there's a great sense of relief in the regulars at the library who are finally able to get back to their happy place. Uh, many other things going on in the city. Uh, as uh, Councillor Keaveney mentioned, uh, we're doing very well with our open patios in the downtown. They seem to be just swarmed with people day in and day out, uh, which I know is making a, a lot of our uh, local restaurants very happy to see people returning that way. And I just attribute it to people being tired of their own cooking for so many months. Uh, but uh, whatever it is, it's uh, working out very well. Uh, our planning department is very build very busy. The uh, developers are coming out in droves and trying to get back to what they were doing uh, before. And uh, Owen Sound also is trying to organize a couple of uh, drive-in movie nights at the Bayshore Community Center. And we've returned uh, in August to our uh, Sunday night summer concert series, though uh, it's been moved to uh, Kelso Beach Park to accommodate more people. Uh, however, they'll just all have to wear wetsuits to attend. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Uh, Councillor O'Leary, anything to add? Well, I can't figure out why Richard missed out on the uh, huge load of salt that was dropped off at the harbor down next to the elevator. So for those of you who are looking forward to the winter season, it's on its way. 
That's all I have. Very good. Mr. Deputy Warden, I'll just yeah. let you know that uh, Councillor Burley and Warden McQueen have left the meeting for the minister's visit. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I think we're turning next to Southgate and uh, Councillor Woodbury. Thank you. Um, everything's going good in the sunny south here. Uh, we're uh, we have an Agra Expo that's uh, on online uh, and that this weekend. Uh, near Holstein, and uh, they put a lot of work and organization into that. The uh, Dundalk Agriculture Society is going to do a drive-through fall fair, which should be uh, interesting. And uh, other than that, we're moving slowly into getting staff back in and getting things going there. Uh, it's a, a different world trying to figure out how to do things, and uh, we're just enjoying the summer. Thank you, Councillor Woodbury. Uh, Councillor Mill. Thank you, Buck. Uh, and it's uh, the same as Meaford. Uh, our farmers market is now open for in-person shopping, so they're uh, they're quite happy. But they've had a good season so far uh, with the curbside pickup, but they're happy to be serving customers in person again now. I want to give a shout out to uh, Pat Hoy and his staff. Gray Road Nine down here is awesome. They uh, they put the top lift on the asphalt. Uh, I think that was the end of last week, or maybe the first of this week. I was actually out on it yesterday and I was coming along and there was a, a young lad ahead of me on a dirt bike and he was catwalking down the road. So he was pretty confident that the asphalt was nice and smooth and it was. So we just need the lines and the shoulders and we'd be all set. Uh, and as in, as far as uh, the Gray Highlands clerk, uh, you're welcome, uh, Councillor Desai. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mill. We'll turn next to the town of the Blue Mountains and Councillor Soever. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Warden. Uh, a lot going on in the town of Blue Mountains. Uh, municipal projects are proceeding well. We, we, uh, the demolishing of the former food land, uh, which uh, was purchased by the town as a potential site for attainable housing, was completed. Uh, it was done uh, un about 50% under budget um, and um, the, the, all the material is being recycled. Uh, nothing's going to the dump. The concrete blocks are being ground into a gravel for municipal use. Uh, the steel frame is being sold. Everything's being salvaged. So that is good news and it's a very green project. Um, the long awaited sidewalks in Clarksburg are being completed uh, and we've uh, finished uh, shoreline restoration at Little River Park. So. Lots of municipal projects. Um, um, also, the community has been very active. Uh, last week, I attended the launch of our Tree Trust. This is a citizen-led initiative that um, raises money and selects trees throughout the town to be preserved. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, about planting new trees for, for carbon sequestration and CO2 reduction, um, but um, you know, large trees that are already growing are probably uh, much more efficient at that. You'd have to plant a lot of little trees to um, match one large maple tree. So the tree that was uh, selected is about 200 years old and it survived the building of the railroad here. It's only 20 feet from the Georgian Trail. Um, most majestic, but it does need a bit of work in terms of pruning um, back the edges so that it'll grow up the middle. And we learned a lot about how to preserve older trees. The arborist says it could live for another 200 years if we take care of it. So these citizens are raising the money and the arborist donated this time and uh, this tree will have a long, hopefully a long and happy life. Um, we also had our lobster fest. Uh, we it raised twenty two thousand dollars for the um, grants and donations committee of the town, as well as our community partners, the Beaver Valley Outreach and the Marsh Street Center. And as well, it was held in the Legion parking lot, so the Legion could run the bar. They've of course uh, been closed for a while, so they they raised some additional funds, and I'm not sure exactly what that number was, but. I was there and I want to thank the warden and also Minister McLeod, who's up again today, was there as well as our MPP, uh, Terry Dowdle. So it was a very successful event um, and 
it was organized by the grants and donations committee, but the volunteers were all provided from these groups. Um, yesterday, um, we also had uh, the parliamentary assistant to the solicitor general here. We received a grant uh, for $300,000 for um, a mobile victims unit. This unit is a van that includes a service dog and trained um, child advocacy personnel so that when there are young victims of crime, uh, you know, assault or sexual assault or something, they now do not have to travel to either Aurelia or Barry to get interviewed in a very cold atmosphere. The van will bring the investigators and video equipment and everything to the victim and they can be interviewed in a, in a much more local environment, a friendly environment with a service dog present and and it, it helps relax the victims. And so they're not re-traumatized when they're telling their story. So this is a great initiative that was uh, uh, pioneered by our uh, local, by the OPP who we, we retain for services with the support of our police services board. So our police services board is acting as the, uh, the, the proponent and the keeper of the funds to, to dole back to the OPP um, for administrative purposes. And this will serve a broad area around the town of Blue Mountains. Um, in this part of Gray County and Simcoe County as well. Um, other than that, um, we also received our, our provincial funding uh, yesterday and we're very happy to receive that. We've, great, we've had a, quite a few expenses in expanding our bylaw services for the summer and no matter how many officers you have, there never seems to be enough to um, follow the, all the tourists around that are arriving in the area. So uh, it's very much appreciated uh, that the provincial government uh, sent us this uh, funding so that um, we can manage, uh, I don't know how many there are. Normally we have 2.5 million visitors this summer, but this summer it seems like there's at least double the number. So I'm sure we'll, we'll have some idea from the uh, Blue Mountain Resort keeps pretty good statistics by the end of the summer, but it's truly been a different summer. And so this, these funds are really appreciated. Thank you, Councillor Sewever. Uh, the OPP initiative sounds really interesting. And I have to say the pictures of the Lobster Fest were also uh, quite fabulous. Nice to see that. Uh, Councillor Potter, you're next. Uh, thank you. And yes, the Lobster Fest, I uh, couldn't uh, help out this year, but I did enjoy some of the lobster and that's my good news. Um, but uh, the mayor, the mayor, uh, councillor Swever did cover a lot of the stuff. It is great to see the sidewalks at Clarksburg, which have been needed for a long time, and we're glad to have that done. Uh, and just to add a couple of quick things, uh, the Blue Mountains Public Library will reopen to the public on uh, this coming week on Tuesday. Uh, they took a little extra time to, to, uh, uh, refinish the floors. So it, it just was a great time to do that. And it meant staying closed a week longer, but it will, I think it'll be well worth it. Uh, and they always have lots of stuff going on. If you, if you go to their, uh, their website, uh, lots of stuff going on online, including craft shows or craft programs, trivia nights, summer reading club, and so on. Uh, and I also understand that the March street center is uh, beginning to slowly uh, get some new programs up and running again. So things are beginning to open up again, but very carefully, as the mayor said, uh, lots of people around. Uh, it's great to see people enjoying themselves. We just have a real challenge to make sure they do it safely. So that's it for me. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potterson. And we turn next to the always patient municipality of West Gray and Councillor Robinson. Well, thank you, Deputy Warden, and good morning, County Council. Um, I was pleased on behalf of West Gray to participate as a delegation at the Provincial Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Um, there was a meeting uh, beginning of August. Um, I spoke regarding the impacts of COVID on certain sectors of the economy. So I was rather pleased to um, be representing in that fashion. Also, I'm looking forward to next week and our delegations through AMO. 
Thank you, Deputy Warden. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. And last but not least, Councillor Hutchinson. I did see him log out at one point. Well, um, actually, I, yeah, morning, Deputy Warden Hickson. Thank you. I actually, uh, my internet went down and I had to uh, just come back in. But uh, okay. anyways, I, I'm pleased to say that we actually, uh, the Economic Development Committee in West Gray completed the CIP portion of the, what we're working on. And it went out for, uh, we had a, held a public meeting this week. So uh, I, I think we're one step closer and we're getting closer to having our CIP in place. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hutchinson. Um, I would like to add uh, a congratulations uh, to uh, Councillors Clumpus and Keaveney uh, because, and, and to the entire staff of uh, the municipality of Meaford because I enjoyed uh, four days and three nights at beautiful uh, Memorial Park. And I have to tell you, that place is a real gem. Last year, I had the pleasure of staying in the town of Blue Mountains uh, or, and uh, that was wonderful, but uh, Memorial Park, a real gem, and I have to congratulate your staff. They run a, a really clean, really ship uh, operation. It is an absolute gem. I enjoyed my time there. I was able to enjoy the bike trail. Uh, I was able to enjoy the harbor. Uh, my daughter swam for hours, uh, and we just had a, a really, really great time. So if everybody else has a chance to really check out Memorial Park, one of the few places where you can do a hookup and you get uh, uh, you get sewer hookup, you get the water, um, and uh, it's just a, a, a wonderful place. I believe that Owen Sound also has a sewer hookup, if I'm not uh, incorrect. But uh, thank you again, folks. You're, you're doing a great job there, and Memorial Park is a real gem. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, word of praise that I will certainly pass on to our staff, but. Uh, we can't uh, pay for that kind of advertising. So thank you, Deputy Warden. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. It's uh, well deserved. Uh, so now I'm turning to back to the agenda and I'm looking for a motion to adjourn and that's going to come from Councillor O'Leary and seconded by Councillor Milne. Any discussion? Uh, any opposed? Then we are adjourned. And we will turn our attention next, just take a second to move over to Committee of the Whole and give you a chance to, does anyone need a break? Let me look here. I'm seeing no, okay, so we'll continue on then. Just take a second to pull up your uh, notes, as I will mine. So I will call this meeting to order. This is the Committee of the Whole, August 13th, uh, 2020. Um, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we will proceed. We'll move to item number three, which is a delegation. Madam Clerk, are our, um, our guests in attendance? Yes, um, Rob Hatton will allow them in. They're just sitting in the waiting room. Okay. Is someone going to make an introduction of these uh, guests or would you like me to? Brandy? Or Scott. Scott, I think, has joined us and he's presenting the report. So he would probably yeah. be able to introduce Christine. Very yeah, I'll good. turn it over to Scott. Yes. Uh, have the guests uh, joined? We'll maybe wait until they join. So I see Christine has joined. And Anthony is on as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Collins? Warden Hicks. Oh, sorry. My apologies. Do we have a uh, Colin as well? I don't think he has joined us. Okay. Through through the chair, they're together. They're in okay. front of the same computer. Oh, very good. So Anthony and Colin are together. Okay, Scott, you're on. Hey, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Warden Hicks. Uh, joining us this morning, we have uh, Christine Loft from, from Loft Planning, who has been the planner for the Georgian Heights proposal. And uh, we have Anthony and Colin, who are both uh, congregation members of the uh, proposed place of worship and, uh, and school facility. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to them and I'll speak later during the report section. Very good. Thank, thank you, Scott. You. I don't know who would like to start, Christine. I'll yeah. start. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Christine Loft, and I'm the planning consultant working on behalf of the applicant, Georgian Heights. Um, I am going to keep my comments fairly brief. Scott's report is very <coughs> thorough, and I think from that report, you can see the extensive 
um, review and back and forth that um, the county staff, municipal staff and I yeah, have yeah, had. Yeah. So um, with me today, as you've indicated, are, are Anthony Penner and Colin Bartell, who are congregation members. And they were involved in discussions with the county and the municipality early on prior to um, the congregation in, engaging my services. So certainly Anthony and Colin are um, aware of the process and have the full history on the application. They were also at the pre-consultation meeting as well as the statutory public meeting. So before you are official plan amendments to permit a private school and a place of worship at 137855 Gray Road 12 in the municipality of Meaford. And the lands are designated agricultural. Georgian Heights have been, to, been committed to finding a location to establish a private school and church for their congregation. They spent 20, 2016 and 2017 searching for sites. And when sites came um, to their attention, they would uh, request comments from municipal staff um, and, and had discussions about many sites over those two years. In 2018, the subject lands became available and, um, and then my services were engaged and planning applications ensued. And since that time, the congregation has now closed on the deal and, and are the owners of the property. So once I was engaged in 2018, then the, we had a formal pre-consultation meeting with county staff and um, a review of what the overall planning process would look like. We did hear the comments from county council at the time of the early information report that was before you and moving forward through into the statutory public meeting. Um, planning staff, both Scott and Liz at the municipality of Meaford, um, have had a lot of communication on this file, a lot of back and forth, um, many addendums on my part focusing on policy areas um, that we felt needed to be met, both from the early county council comments, um, as well as ministry comments that Scott had received. So at this point, um, we feel that, that we've sort of covered off all of the policy review um, the primary focus of those addendums and a lot of our back and forth was location and the overall locational search, um, MDS requirements, and as well as just a general policy review of the related use. So on behalf of Georgian Heights, I'm confident that the applicants have identified um, their general search area. They've definitely met the overall requirements, in my opinion, for the locational search. They did look for lands that were rurally designated. Um, first and foremost, and ultimately the only property that, that met their locational search was not on Highway 26, was of a suitable size, and also was available, available for purchase, which of course is not written in the policy, but it's rather important when you're purchasing lands. So with respect to the MDS, there has been a thorough review, um, discussions, addendums, and back and forth with Scott and Liz. And Scott's staff report, um, I think, has a, has a good summary of that MDS and much of it, um, the chart and the back and forth that we've had are identified in the staff report before you, so I, I won't go into the details. Um, Georgian Heights is looking forward to investing in their community and establishing the school and this church for their congregation and having a location that the congregation can use for gathering for their outdoor activities and for continued learning. So on behalf of Georgian Heights, we would ask committee to support the recommendation before you. And now through the chair, Anthony and Colin um, have a few words um, to speak to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Loft. So Anthony and Colin, it's, you're on deck. Can you hear us? We can, yes. Okay, well, I thank you for the opportunity to consider this application. A uh, few points that we want to uh, lift out as far as the size of our, our, I should back up a little bit. I'm going to present a few points and then Colin will also cover a few points. Um, the, the size of our congregation, we're currently at about 80 people gathering. There are other families looking to 
that have purchased land and are looking to move into this area and there's other interest. Um, it's not been uh, super fast growing, but it's uh, just a steady growth and, and I think that's good. Uh, as far as this area, the importance of this area, it's a community that we, we've fallen in love with. We, we like this area, we like the community, the people, and our goal is to be an asset to the community. And uh, we, we've been searching. I add up the amount of time we've been searching. It's getting close to five years that we've been searching. We've presented many, this property and that one and talked to um, Rob Armstrong. Would this one work? And we come up with what we felt was, was uh, the best solution that we had available. It's centrally located and it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a area more, more in the rural without crowding neighbors in a rural setting play areas, all of that to accommodate what we're looking for. Um, and as far as being part of the community, our goal is to be a part of this community, to be a support, to be an asset to the larger community. We have different events that we've put on and invited many in the community to. Christmas concerts, senior suppers, uh, more recently, there was a elderly lady that passed away. Our youth group went, uh, we put an evening together and went to help clean up her house for the family, just hauling out garbage and just cleaning up the yard and other events such as there's been fires after fires. We've assisted in clean up there and we want to continue to do this. So I'll turn it over to Colin. He can take the last few points that we have. Yes, good morning. Thank good you morning. very much for consideration. Um, let's see, where did you stop, Anthony? Um, well, here's a point, here's a point about uh, um, what it means, you know, to, to, to get our own facility. It feels like, like so far we've been renting like community halls and uh, a few different community halls. We've rented the, the old uh, Meaford offices there in Rockland. That's where we're currently having our school. And so, so we're enough people now. It just feels like, like it, is, it is soon time to get into an established place. So uh, I know we're meeting at Bogner now for our church services. Well, not now during COVID, but uh, but they're planning a big renovation there. So so then we'll be looking again. But anyway, so that'll feel good to us if we can if we can get an established spot to meet. And and this one is so nicely centrally located for us. Um, another thing, yeah, we know the big thing is it's ag land. Um, it feels to us like this might be a good choice if, if we do need to use ag land because, because it is just a small piece cut off by the river. So we were hoping that you would feel that way as well. So I guess the last point on our list here is, is our vision or goals for this facility, which of course would be our, our weekly Sunday meetings Probably, probably once a month for sure. We'd have a Sunday evening meeting, you know that. Uh, and this is this is everybody welcome in the community as well. We'd have that sign by the road. <coughs> um, and those community community events that were that were earlier brought up, like Christmas concerts and senior suppers. Sometimes you have to put on a senior supper for Thanksgiving, weddings, funerals, things like that. So. Um, and I think we have, I've counted up at least, uh, what was it, seven, eight, nine, I think there's 10 of our, 10 people listening to this as well. They're showing their support and interest from our group. So just thought I'd let you know that. 
And that's about that's about what we have here, I guess. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Loft, uh, Mr. Penner, and Mr. Bartel for your, <clears throat> your delegation. And thank you as well for attending all those supporters of uh, Georgian Heights uh, Church. I'll turn things over to council now. Are there any questions of the delegates? Seeing none, thank you very much for your attendance again. Uh, council will move to item number four. We're looking at the consent agenda. Is there anything that requires a separate discussion? And if there is not, then I will uh, entertain a motion, which is uh, moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Potter. Mr. Deputy uh, Warden? Yeah. Yes? Um, I would like to pull item G which is the minutes of the Affordable Housing Task Force. Thank you. So we're back to the motion then, uh, with the exception of item G, which will be pulled at the end. Um, moved by Councillor Patterson, uh, seconded by Councillor Potter, uh, that we approve the consent uh, agenda as presented. Um, anybody opposed? Seeing uh, no objection, that is carried. So we are now going to turn item number six, <clears throat> 6A, which is going to be the Georgian Heights uh, Church uh, discussion. And Scott, I believe that you will be uh, presenting that. Um, and it's moved by Councillor uh, Clumpus and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Uh, so Scott, you're on. Great. Uh, thanks again, Deputy Warden Hicks and, and uh, members of council. I am going to try to share my screen here. Uh, can everyone see the uh, presentation that's come up there, hopefully? Yes, I can see it. Okay, excellent. I will get going then. Um, so our, our delegation gave a great overview of, of the uh, process to date, so I'll try to keep this uh, somewhat brief. I know my, my report was fairly lengthy in this regard. I will say from a staff perspective, just to, to quote a former county councillor, uh, we've kind of got splinters here because we've been sitting on the fence so long on this one, um, because there really are lots of compelling reasons to, to support this proposal, and ultimately my staff report is recommending approval of this proposal, um, but there are some policy concerns that have been raised um, that, that would, would also lead for uh, an argument that uh, maybe we wouldn't consider this. But again, my, my recommendation is that we do support it. And I'll just walk you through a bit of that. Um, the lands uh, in question are highlighted on your screen there. Um, they are about 10 hectares in, side, in size. They're southwest of, of the current uh, former town of Meaford uh, by about uh, 4.5 kilometers away. As you can see, they do have direct access onto Gray Road 12 and, and the rear property of the boundary backs onto uh, the Big Head River in this regard. Um, what they're proposing, as we've heard, is, is a joint uh, school and place of worship. And I should note that from both a, a county and provincial policy perspective, um, this proposal would be supported um, wholeheartedly by the policy. And in fact, we wouldn't even need a county official plan amendment uh, if the congregants of this operation uh, relied on horse-drawn vehicles as their primary mode of, pr of transportation. Uh, both provincial policy and, and uh, county policy has exemptions in place uh, for institutional uses for uh, um, communities that use horse-drawn vehicles. Um, but in this case, the, the proposed users of the, this facility uh, would use a mixture of, of uh, private automobile, but also active transportation in terms of uh, walking and, and uh, bicycling to the facility. And as we've heard, uh, there are a number of, of uh, people that live in the area and, and uh, greater interest in, in moving to the area as well. Uh, the proposed facility is, is going to be serviced by a well and septic system. And I should note that the municipality of Meaford has recently adopted their municipal official plan amendment on this file and approved the, the zoning bylaw amendment, which are both contingent on approval from the county of uh, the county official plan amendment. Uh, the next slide just shows a rendering that's uh, been supplied by the applicant of, of what the proposed facility uh, may look like in this regard. 
Um, as as uh, Ms. Loth mentioned, uh, there has been a, a lot of discussion on this one. Uh, we had a great public meeting uh, with the municipality of Meaford, a joint public meeting. Uh, it was a packed house that night, and, and it was all thanks to uh, supporters of, of the proposed uh, place of worship and, and school uh, there to, to support the uh, proposal. Um, we did have a number of, of planning addendums prepared by Ms. Loft, and, and there was also some servicing work and some environmental work prepared uh, in, in support of this uh, proposal. In terms of public comments, we heard uh, questions about, uh, about the uh, local water supply and septic systems. In this regard, I would say that the, the servicing analysis has uh, demonstrated that it can be serviced via private services and that uh, the, the proposed septic system is under the threshold whereby we need any sort of provincial approval on that septic system. Uh, one, of the farm, one of the public comments was with respect to uh, the impacts of farming on the Big Head River. And as much as that's an important comment, it's not something we can really consider through this application. Uh, and, and things like the application of pesticides or fertilizers aren't something that we can get into in our planning documents. And I would further note that in this case, they're proposing the institutional facility and, and not a new uh, farming operation along the river here. Um, there were some questions about what's called the natural severance on this one. So this, this piece of property used to be part of a, a slightly larger piece of land. Uh, and based on the, the river uh, cutting through the rear of the property and a strip of county owned land, uh, they were able to go through a natural severance process which is a process which doesn't require any uh, public consultation. It doesn't require any um, municipal approvals or county approvals. Uh, it's more of a legal process. So the public was just trying to understand and rightfully so uh, how this lot came to be created. And then we also did have some comments uh, with respect to uh, traffic and road safety, uh, just based on the fact that we could have children uh, walking or cycling to this facility along Gray Road 12. And I will say that our county transportation staff um, have been very useful in, in their original comments on the application, simply noting that they'd require a commercial entrance permit, but also then in going through and reviewing those public comments and, and, uh, and, and helping ensure that, uh, that what we have before us, if approved, uh, will in fact be safe for all users uh, of Gray Road 12 in this regard. Um, we did get comments from a lot of the regular agencies uh, uh, they are generally supportive with respect to the proposal, uh, other than a few comments from some of the provincial ministries, which I'll get into in just a second. Uh, Gray Sabo will require a permit uh, for this proposal uh, based on the proximity to the, the Big Head River in this regard. And they've given some technical specifications and, and made some minor adjustments to the proposal just to make sure that the proposed development is outside of any areas which, uh, which could potentially uh, flood in this regard. Um, the ministry staff uh, from Municipal Affairs and, and uh, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs have been uh, tremendously helpful on this application. Um, in addition to, to the many discussions I had with Meaford staff on this and, and Christine Loff and her client had uh, with, with uh, Meaford staff as well, um, we've taken a lot of guidance from the ministry here, uh, just both in terms of this application and, and their perspective on, on how uh, similar applications may have been dealt with across the rest of the province. The ministry comments uh, really boil down to, to uh, two, for, two outstanding issues, if you will. Um, their initial comment was with respect to, well, have you adequately searched elsewhere outside of an agricultural area uh, where you could put this site? And, and as we heard from, uh, from uh, our delegation today, uh, they've been searching for almost five years now. And, and I can personally attest to, to many uh, emails and phone calls uh, where they had a, a new potential lead and, and they'd ask about a property and, and uh, uh, in some cases, for whatever reason, it simply wasn't, uh, wasn't feasible for this uh, location. Um, in this regard, they have uh, narrowed their search to rural areas um, because the community and, and the congregants of this proposed operation uh, do lead a, a rural way of life, uh, similar to, to um, uh, some of the horse and buggy institutional op operations uh, we're used to seeing in other parts of the countryside. Um, the, the other issue that the ministry had raised comments was, with was with respect to minimum distance separation. And I'm just going to go into this a little bit. Um, for those that may be un unfamiliar, minimum distance separation is the provincial formula uh, that guides municipalities um, in terms of citing either new farm or non-farm uses. And, and there's two separate formulas, one if you're looking at a new non-farm use and one if you're looking at a new farm use. Uh, and, and they're specifically meant to uh, put appropriate setbacks in place 
um, from livestock facilities or manure storage facilities um, such that we minimize the possibility for, for uh, odor-based conflicts between uh, livestock and manure storage in that regard. And they further break it down uh, when we're looking at citing new non-farm uses and into two types of, uh, of uh, applications, if you will. There's a type A use, which is generally, you know, a residential dwelling or, or a more minor non-farm use, if you will. And that has what's called a single factor MDS calculation. So it's, it's less of a separation distance. And I should note here that if this were a horse and buggy uh, institutional operation, it would be clear that this is a, this would be a type A MDS calculation. Uh, the province also sets aside a type B MDS calculation, which is roughly double the setback distance from a type A. Uh, and these are for uses that you might find in the countryside that have a higher level of, of use uh, and, and therefore potentially more potential for conflict. And, and the line the ministry has drawn in the sand in this regard is that all other institutional uses beyond the, those served by horse and buggy uh, fall into this type B application of, of uh, minimum distance separation. And the, um, the province has been useful on, on instructing us about the guideline in this regard. And, and Christine and her team have been great about um, doing the calculations, both from a type A perspective and a type B perspective uh, to neighboring livestock uh, facilities. And, and uh, there, are, there were six uh, farms identified in this regard. And, and in terms of the minimum distance separation calculations, they meet the, the required setback distance for a type A use on all six and a type B use uh, they would meet it on, on four of the six uh, operations. So there are two that, uh, that, that wouldn't quite, quite meet that setback distance to on a type B use. And, and uh, what Ms. Loft has put forward um, is, is uh, if you like, a common sense approach to suggest that this should be considered a type A use because uh, for all intents and purposes, it would function very similar to those institutional uses uh, utilized by, by people who rely on horse and buggy. Uh, these are members of our rural and farm community and therefore uh, it's very light, unlikely um, that there would be any sort of odor conflict in this regard. Uh, so they've, they've uh, provided um, um, justification to, to consider this as a type A calculation. And I will say the provincial guidelines uh, do allow municipalities to consider a variance to MDS um, uh, where uh, individual site-specific circumstances uh, uh, would support that. And, and both county and municipal staff have been very um, stringent in the past on, on applying these variances uh, just to uh, uh, really protect our farm community. So they're, they're not done very often, uh, but there have been a few uh, over the years. And finally, what I just wanted to outline is, is as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, um, there is some um, uh, strong rationale for support of this proposal, um, but there are some outstanding um, uh, policy concerns that could lead to, to a, a refusal or a challenge of this proposal. Um, I have covered the, the MDS and, and what I will say in this regard is if this proposal were not to be located on this property, uh, we have a four hectare existing property. So we're not expecting a, a major farming operation to locate on this property. Uh, the most likely use should this proposal not be cited here would be a house. And a house would be considered a type A. So what uh, Ms. Loft has, has recommended and, and what Meaford has done through their municipal approvals is to suggest that this use be considered here and that a variance be considered here to consider this a type A uh, use such that uh, it wouldn't have negative impacts on neighboring farms if they were ever to go and, and uh, try to expand their, their um, uh, farming operations, whether it be their barns or their manure storage facilities. Uh, I would note that this is, this is the one objection that the province has, has outlined in this regard. Um, with respect to applications of this nature or any planning application, uh, planning staff always try to uh, uh, envision what would happen if, if council's decision was, was appealed in this regard. So in this case, um, if, if um, council saw fit to approve the proposal and, and that approval was, was um, uh, appealed, whether it be by a neighbor or even potentially by the province, you know, what would our arguments be? And, and uh, yeah, as I stated earlier, I, I do think we could put forward the argument that uh, they have done an extensive search to try to find a location here. Uh, and they've taken a, a fairly practical, uh, if you like, common sense approach to the application 
of the minimum distance separation policies here and the variance in that regard, and trying to ensure that neighboring farms would not be restricted from future expansion should they, should they seek to expand in the future. Um, should council um, seek to, to refuse this application, um, we, we could take a hard line approach on the policy and, and say that no, the provincial guidelines are, are clear that this is a type B use and, and because it doesn't meet it to two of the four farming operations, uh, maybe there should be refusal. Uh, in this case, if there was a refusal, the potential appeals would be either the proponent themselves uh, or the municipality of Meaford. And I really do think if this went to the local planning appeal tribunal, um, it, is, it is almost a 50-50 or a coin toss here as to whether or not the, the uh, tribunal would, would support or, or deny this application. Um, there are yeah, very strong either arguments on either side. Um, should there be an appeal of an approval, um, the county's current appeal protocol is that we wouldn't be at the tribunal um, to support that. We typically don't uh, appear before the tribunal to support private development applications uh, where council has approved it. Uh, however, should council seek to, to refuse this application, um, then we would be there and, and we would be called upon to defend that position. However, as I said, um, staff are satisfied that uh, official plan amendment number five um, does, uh, does uh, meet the tests um, set out by both provincial and local policy. And we are recommending support of this proposal and that the bylaw be prepared for the, uh, the coming uh, county council session in, in September. So that's all I have at this stage, but I'll certainly be happy to take any questions if there are any. It would help if I turned myself off mute. Uh, thank you, Scott, for that uh, presentation and uh, for your report. I have to say, my goodness, what a lot of uh, work has gone into this and a lot of time uh, spent and uh, certainly the rendition looks uh, very, very good. Uh, Council, are there any questions? Deputy Warden, I have Councillor Soever and Potter. Thank you, we'll start with Councillor Soever. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Warden. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm inclined to support the, the proposal. Um, however, I, I have a question. Uh, would it be possible to put her, I noticed one of the concerns was that a future uh, owner, what a future owner might do if the property was ever sold or any potential, uh, you know, um, future uses. And I wouldn't want our approval to uh, apply to uh, any future uses which might be against the provincial policy. So um, I'm wondering if it's possible to require that a restrictive covenant be put on um, which limits its future uses should the property be sold. I think its current use as a place of worship for a largely rural community and, and a school is not going to really be in conflict with the adjacent farming operations and and obviously for rural kids it's great to have a rural school rather than in a settlement area but um, should uh, things change and you know land values are very uh, expensive there and that property ever be sold um, I wouldn't want um, you know the the new owner to be thinking that they're buying a place that is, um, you know, grandfathered. Um, so I'm just wondering if it might be possible to put restrictive covenants on uh, the uses. So Scott, I don't know if you're the appropriate person to respond or perhaps uh, legal counsel. I, I can uh, maybe start us off here. And, and uh, if, if uh, Michael wants to chime in afterwards, that would be great. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Soever. I, I must admit that's not something we've investigated as, as part of this proposal. Um, we have thought forward to, you know, what would the potential future use be? And, and you know, many of our former churches and, and one-room schoolhouses across, across the county, um, you know, when, when they cease to be needed for, for those institutional uses, quite often were ultimately renovated to become residential uses. And, and certainly I don't see a, a conflict should this, this use ever uh, cease to be with, with someone, you know, converting the building to a house and, you know, it'd be very similar to, to the other houses along um, Gray Road 12 in that regard. Um, one of the struggles with this application has been that we typically plan for the land and the land use and, and we don't typically uh, plan for the specific users of, of the application. And, and, and so, you know, there's a, an adage in planning that, that we don't zone based on the people, so to speak. 
Um, but we have had to think about this one, as, as you've raised, um, uh, from a, what would the future use be? I'm not aware of um, whether or not a restrictive covenant would be useful in that regard. Uh, I, I think if, if, um, if legal counsel were supportive and if we wanted to go down that route, um, from a staff perspective, I'd, I'd recommend maybe sort of buttoning down the future uses, but but still allowing for certain other ones like a residential use. Uh, I'm not sure if Michael would have any further comments on, on the use of a covenant in this regard. Sure. Michael? Uh, good morning, County Council. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly fine. Uh, I could give some comments, but I would suggest that they would be best addressed in closed session. So Very I'd leave good. it to where you want to go with that. Um, perhaps, uh, Madam Clerk, I'll look for your uh, guidance on this, uh, but perhaps we can go to other questions and, and we'll determine at the end of those questions <clears throat> whether there is a need to go into closed session. I think that would be a great approach. We don't have closed session um, on this agenda. So we would need a two thirds uh, vote of council to in order to add it to the agenda. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And we'll turn next to Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Warden. Yes, and my question is along the same lines. We have a lot of experience with this kind of thing, uh, especially with short accommodations. Uh, we just the other day uh, uh, set a requirement that uh, these be listed even in the marketing, mater marketing materials that they cannot, uh, if the, anybody who's thinking of buying should know that they cannot use it as an income property uh, for short-term accommodation. So we, you know, everybody has good intentions at the beginning, but then somewhere down the line, the property sells, a new owner, uh, says that, well, nobody told me, and uh, nobody told me that, uh, you know, a, a livestock uh, operation produces an odor. Um, so we end up with a problem and it would just be clearer to everyone for the sake of clarity to make sure that it's, uh, it's registered and that everybody knows where they stand. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Uh, were there any other uh, hands raised, Madam Clerk? I don't know, Councillor Milne uh, has a hand up. And Councillor Mackey. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, or Deputy Warden rather. I fully understand uh, the challenge with trying to cite uh, a, a facility similar to this. We've ran into this in Southgate with the horse and buggy community on many occasions. And I can tell you, and as Scott as well know, the hard fought uh, exemption for the horse and buggy community is well appreciated and uh, is well used. Um, but my concern here is that this is not a horse and buggy uh, community. They're a car driving community and, and so in that respect, they're no different than any other uh, group that may come forward in our community. And here. Uh, Councillor Mill, uh, something has happened uh, with your sound. I don't know if your microphone has been bumped or something, uh, but I wonder if you could just take a look at that. Can you hear me now? I can hear you very, very faintly. Well, I'll try to speak up. Is that better? Somewhat, but uh, yes, <laughs> not great. I don't, what's, uh, I don't know what's wrong. Okay, I, I can hear you in a very faded way, so continue. All right. So. The uh, challenges of this uh, application, and I can appreciate that they want to be in a rural setting, but that in my mind is not a valid reason for circumventing the policies that are put in place to protect the ag community. Um, there's a reason why we designated some of our lands agricultural and some rural, and that's to protect the ag community from nuisance complaints. If some of you remember back in the 80s, 40 years ago, there was a thing called a retirement lot and farmers were afforded retirement lots. Well, the average retirement lot lasted about five years and then it was sold to a non-ag community or a non-ag occupant and the fight is on. 
about smell, dust, noise, everything else. I'm not suggesting that would happen in this case, but I, I, I feel very strongly that the reasons for the ag policies are put in place for good reason. And, and the reason that is put forward here basically to say that while we wanna be in a rural setting and we can't find anything else, that's not good enough. If somebody comes to me and says, well, I really wanna put my house in a rural setting and I'd like to put my severance here, I'm sorry, if it's designated agricultural, sorry, you, you, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna go down this road again and cause conflict in the future because ultimately that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna have a scrap down the road. It may not be us dealing with it, but somebody will be. And I, I can't support this. Um, I've seen too much from the past that has come back to bite us and cause conflict. I, I fully understand staff's conflict on this because, or, or their, their hesitation because they've gone back and forth and they've done a lot of work on this. And I appreciate that, uh, but I, I, I cannot support this. And finally, I would just say, it would be interesting to know if we had the Ag Advisory Committee in place, what their thoughts would be. And I suspect I know what it might be, but we can only speculate. That's all I have, Mr. Uh, Deputy Warden. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Milne. And despite the uh, sound issues, your voice was loud and clear, <laughs> as, as was your position, <laughs> passionate uh, as it was. Uh, we turn next to Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Warden. And through you to uh, Scott, uh, you mentioned, Scott, that uh, two farming operations uh, uh, fall within the, the B schedule of, uh, of MDS. Uh, if County Council approves this application, could those two farming operations be impacted as far as uh, future farm operations? Scott? Sure, through you, Deputy Warden. Um, thanks for that question. So in this case, what staff are recommending along with the, the um, uh, approval should Council uh, look, uh, look to approve this would be uh, an exemption to, to clarify that, that this is a type A land use, um, such that the neighboring farm operations wouldn't be any further uh, impacted than if there was a house built on this property in the future, which is the other potentially logical use. Um, I will say that in this particular area of the municipality, there is already uh, a, a decent number of non-farm lots in the area. So in some cases, the farms are already restricted uh, by some of the houses that uh, were, were severed in the past that, uh, you know, as Councillor Milne pointed out, certainly wouldn't be supported for, for severance today. Um, but they wouldn't, the, the, the farms wouldn't be any further impacted by this proposal um, if council were to support the exemption to the type A, um, but that certainly doesn't mean that the farms can already expand because there, there are some issues in the area already. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, that's. Well, th thanks, Scott. I guess I'm struggling, you know, uh, like Councillor Millen, that uh, with the exemption to the A, um, this is clearly a, a B type uh, operation. So. I'm having some difficulty with that one. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any other hands that raised? Yes, Councillor Clumpus and Councillor okay. Millen has a, a secondary question. We'll start with Councillor Clumpus. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Warden, and uh, to all for your for your comments, and especially to Scott for a very very thorough presentation and also report on this issue. Um, we too struggled uh, with the, the uh, demands of um, the current uh, official plan um, in this regard specific to the horse and buggy uh, transportation issue. Uh, but it, it seems one of the things that um, uh, is of concern to us as to all of our rural communities is in the loss of productive farmland. Uh, to either a commercial uh, venture or housing or, or something of that nature. So that too is, it was uh, certainly kept in mind when we uh, looked at this from the, from the decision point of view. Um, the, the statement that uh, the land in question 
is not a particularly productive um, venue for, for agricultural product. And uh, the fact too that uh, this type of a building a community um, is also attracting other farm, farm uh, families to come into our area uh, who are, are purchasing farm uh, agricultural uh, properties. And we value that and appreciate it. And uh, so from that perspective, uh, looking at the thorough, thorough investigation and uh, consideration from uh, not only the proponent and um, Christy Loft, their planner, uh, but also um, talking with the proponents themselves, uh, I've really come to understand uh, what it is they hope to achieve and what they, they uh, uh, plan on, on uh, becoming as, uh, as fully um, integrated members of our, uh, of our community, and we welcome that. My other understanding is that um, should an amendment be, be granted here for, for this uh, official plan, should the property be uh, sold in the future um, and an amendment would be then required for that particular uh, permitted use, um, there would have to be an application which would then at that time be considered for alternate uses for that, uh, for that uh, amendment. So uh, from that perspective, I feel that um, that worry or that concern is somewhat mitigated and, and protected uh, for the future. But in the meantime, this is, a, um, is deemed by our, our council and hopefully by many of our, uh, my fellow colleagues on uh, County Council to, to be a, a very worthwhile um, endeavor uh, for that particular uh, piece of land. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Thank you, Councilor Klumpus. Uh, Councilor Milne. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I don't know, has my sound been uh, improved any? It, it is improved, sir, yes. All right, All right. well, I'll speak louder anyway. Um, I just a question for Ke or, uh, Scott, rather. If this church or this facility existed now, and I owned a farm across the road and wanted to build a dairy barn, would this be, would the MDS calculation be a type A or a type B? Scott? Sure. Through, through you, Deputy Warden. If, if the, uh, the institutional facility already existed on this site uh, and there was no site-specific zoning exemptions in place, uh, then in that regard, it would be up to the, the building official to determine whether this is a horse and buggy institutional operation or a non-horse and buggy institutional operation. And if it was a non-horse and buggy institutional operation, then the provincial guidelines would, would say it's a type B, so the double factor MDS in this regard. And if I might, Mr. Deputy Warden, we've run into this situation in Southgate on different occasions as well. And I, I just know how it would go if we tried to push through with, well, we want to put a dairy barn here, we can't put it halfway in the back of the farm and build a, you know, a 500 foot driveway back to the dairy barn. Anyway, I've, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Councillor Milne. Um, uh, I see Councillor Keaveny's hand up. Madam Clerk, was there anyone else? No, I just see Councillor Keaveny as well. Councillor Keaveny? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Warden. And I just wanted to uh, speak in support of uh, Councillor Clumpus's comments. And we did have very, very thorough conversation about uh, this proposal at, uh, at Meaford Council. And uh, I just wanted to reinforce the uh, suggestion that uh, I believe uh, approving this would allow our agricultural community to grow, as has been said, to attract more families. And I think um, I also consider the type of education that would be provided here for the children and that it would be uh, rural based and I think would be very supportive of that growth of our uh, farm area. And uh, I spoke earlier in the good news about the number of farm gate operations that we're seeing. And I know most of those are operated by members of this uh, congregation and they are very much involved and supportive of our community. And I, I would very much like to see this uh, project go forward and recognizing again, the diligence that has been undertaking in trying to secure a location. And, uh, and again, understanding that this, this location has uh, 
taken a long time to uh, discover and it seems to be very appropriate and I think it uh, it is the right decision to go forward and allow this congregation to uh, to build their church and school here. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Keaveney and thank you everyone for uh, your input. Good discussion. Um, Madam Clerk with the, sorry. That's okay. I was gonna uh, say Madam Clerk with your leave uh, I, I think it might be appropriate to entertain a motion if that would come from Councillor Soever and perhaps uh, seconded by Councillor Potter with respect to um, going into closed session. I suppose if people were opposed to going into closed session, they could defeat that motion. That is correct. We would need um, two thirds. Two -thirds. Yes, I do see Councillor Mackey's hand up again for a secondary question. I don't know if you would like to entertain that before we move forward with any anything else. Yes, Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Warden. And uh, through you to Scott, just wondering, uh, has there been any opposition to any of the uh, surrounding farms uh, to this uh, proposal? Scott? Sure. Thank you for that question. In this regard, we haven't had any opposition uh, to the application. Uh, the only comments we had were with respect to just ensuring road safety of, of the users uh, and, and making sure that the servicing was appropriate. Um, but we certainly haven't had any concerns uh, raised uh, by farmers in that regard. Uh, now, the one comment I'll make there is, is that, you know, um, just because there's no concerns doesn't mean there's, there's no potential for future conflict. But at this stage, we, we didn't hear any concerns in that regard. Thank you, Scott. Are you satisfied, uh, Councillor Mackey? Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you. Okay, then I'll turn my attention next. Uh, Councillor Soever, perhaps I'll look to you. Would you like to uh, bring a motion with respect to uh, going into closed session to receive uh, legal advice? Um, I, I don't think it's necessary to go into closed session because the question I asked is not really for legal advice. It was a factual uh, matter as, you know, is the question was not, should we put, um, a restricted covenant on title. That is a decision for council obviously to make. Uh, the question I ask is, is it possible to put a restrictive, uh, and that is a factual matter. It's in the public domain somewhere, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure our solicitor knows the answer. So, um, you know, I don't think that we need to go into close to hear the response, whether it's possible to put a restrictive covenant on title. Um, I know that we do do that <coughs> short-term accommodations uh, in the town of Blue Mountains in, in new developments, just to make sure that the buyer is aware that there, you know, we have a bylaw as well in a zoning uh, and it's impacted by zoning, but so often people don't know what are the conditions of the zoning when they purchase a property. So when there is actually restrict the covenant on title, then it does work. So. I was just wanting the solicitor to confirm whether it's possible that we put that on in this case, which would mean that, you know, the current um, owners obviously would be bound by that and any future purchasers and, you know, and what, so it's not really advice, it's whether it's possible. So I don't know. So yeah. If I might counsel, so ever, I believe that your question was properly posed to our legal counsel and uh, my interpretation is that the answer uh, that you received from uh, Michael was that to answer that, he would recommend, I think, that we go into closed session. Uh, so I, I know that you may uh, differ, but uh, that's what I'm hearing. So I, I will allow you to put your motion if you wish, but if you don't, then we'll proceed with just the vote on the main item. Okay, um, I think we can just move to the vote. Councillor uh, Patterson. Councillor Patterson, thank you. So just to be clear, if the exemption is approved, is it, it's considered site specific? So then if the property is sold, an application would have to be um, made to the municipality to change that use from institutional back to either agricultural or residential or whatever. So that would cover that, right? Scott? Right. Scott? Thank you for that question, Councillor Patterson. That's a, that's a good question. In this case, what's been approved right now in, in the Meaford zoning bylaw um, is an agricultural exception. So essentially what's happening is, is they've taken the permitted uses already allowed on this property 
and added an exception to say that you can have one additional use being a, a institutional facility. And, and by the way, that institutional facility shall be considered a type A land use. Um, so if, if this property were to be sold in the future, uh, somebody could come in and, and put in any one of those uses already permitted in the Meaford zoning bylaw in addition to the institutional use. Um, but the, the exception would rest with the property, not the property owner. Um, so it would still be considered a type A use and it would only be if they were looking at something outside of that list of permitted uses in the Meaford zoning bylaw that then they need a, a zoning amendment in that regard and, and possibly an official plan amendment. And the county official plan amendment is very similar in that we'd still be considering it uh, designated as agricultural, but we'd have this exception on it to consider the, the uh, institutional use in this regard. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. You good? Thank you. Uh, I think, go ahead, Madam Clerk. Um, I have Councillor Potter for a secondary question as well. Okay, Councillor Potter. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Um, and this question is probably to Scott. What impact would this have on neighboring farms if they wanted to expand or change their farming operations in the future? Uh, would they be limited in some way by the proximity to this facility? Uh, because I, I think we want to be careful. The, the, the reason we have right to farm legislation is to not squeeze farmers out of their own properties. And I just want to be sure that by if we do give this approval, and I, I have no qualms at all about about the proposal that we see, I'm thinking about the future. Sure, if it, if it helps, I might just share my screen one more time and, and just bring up the map showing the surrounding area and, and then uh, I'll answer uh, Councillor Potter's question if that's, that's appropriate. So just a second here. Um, can everyone see the air photo that's just come back up on the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, excellent. So it's, it's a good question, Councillor Potter. Thank you. Um, and so what you see is the, the subject lands highlighted in, in blue there. Um, and then you can see the surrounding area. So to the south and, and even to the, to the southwest, we have a whole strip of, of residential lots already. And you can see there's some scattered across the countryside. Um, there's also some barns in the area. So one of the barns is, is up here. One of the barns is over here. Um, one of the barns is actually uh, across the road. And so in this case, um, particularly for the barn across the road, they're already going to be uh, feeling the impacts of, of the other non-farm development in the area. Um, and, and similarly with the barn to the Northwest here, there's, there's a, a, a non-farm property across the road. Um, so there is certainly potential that this could impact um, livestock expansion or, or, or manure storage facility expansion. Um, uh, the, the exception to go to a type A land use would, would minimize that setback distance, uh, but in some cases uh, these barns may already be limited uh, from expanding um, based on the amount of, of non-farm lot creation that's already in the area. And I should say that the county policies are fairly explicit that, that uh, uh, we wouldn't allow for it for a, a church or school to be severed from a farm any longer. And, and we don't allow for this type of non-farm law creation in the agricultural designation any longer for all the reasons that, that uh, Councillor Milne has aptly pointed out. Um, I will say that the lot across the road recently went through a surplus farm dwelling severance. And that is the only type of new non-farm lot creation uh, that's really considered in the agricultural designation other than for agricultural related uses like grain elevators. So to, to answer your question, this is a long-winded answer, I apologize. Um, there is potential that this could impact neighboring farms, um, but, but they are already impacted by the amount of homes and, and non-farm uh, lot creation already in the area. Thank you, Scott. All right, Mr. Deputy I, Warden. Yes. I'm sorry, I have Councillor Desai with a question. Councillor Desai, you've been quiet up till now. You're on. Thank you, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Deputy Warden. Planning is not my forte, so I try to uh, try to say less on on planning matters. But I I do have a question. I I, I do uh, I do quite like Councillor Server's idea of the uh, uh, restrictive covenant. Um, 
and I'm not I'm not going to ask that we go into closed session. My question is related more to procedure, in the sense of um, uh, if if we do go ahead and assuming we approve of uh, of the uh, application in front of us, uh, could there be a follow up motion um, to to put a restrictive covenant on it? Um, or would that not be procedurally okay? Well, I would probably say, Councillor Desai, uh, that if you want the issue of um, a restrictive uh, covenant answered properly, you would probably want to go as recommended by uh, legal counsel to go into closed session. Uh, so again, I, I will allow people to bring that motion if they want to. Otherwise, I think uh, we move on to the main motion and, and have our vote. Okay, no further questions, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Desai. Madam Clerk, anyone else? I see Councillor Clumpus with a secondary. Councillor Clumpus? Councillor Clumpus, you're on mute still. Oh. Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, I would like a recorded vote, please. Very good. All right, so we are ready to uh, take the vote. It's going to be recorded vote and Madam Clerk, uh, you'll take over, but reminding everyone, we're now gonna be using the raise hands uh, uh, feature, correct? No, I will be asking um, oh. and I will ask each person to um, indicate. indicate in favor or opposed. All right, so we are voting on the main motion from Scott's report. Yes. Councillor Mackey. Opposed. Councillor Gamble's not here. Councillor Burley. In favor. Councillor Carlton. In favor. Warden McQueen, I don't think has joined us again. Councillor Desai. Opposed. Councillor Patterson. In favor. Deputy Warden Hicks. In favor. Councillor Clumpus. In favor. Councillor Keaveny. Yes. Councillor Thomas. In favor. Councillor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Woodbury. Opposed. Councillor Millen. Opposed. Councillor Soever. In favor. Councillor Potter. Opposed. Councillor Robinson. Not in favor. Okay, opposed. Councillor Hutchinson. Opposed. Okay, that vote is carried 51 to 31. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And thank you again to uh, this very good discussion. Thank you to our uh, delegates and thank you to all those people who uh, attended supporters of this, uh, uh, of this proposal. Uh, now, um, Madam Clerk, with your leave again, I think maybe it's time for a little break. I would um, agree. Might I suggest that we come back at, uh, it's now five or six past, might I suggest that we come back at 20 past? That would be fine. Thank please you. Ensure, Thank you. Please ensure your cameras and your mics are off for the um, break. Right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll be back at 11.20.
Deputy Warden. Yes, Council Robinson. Hi there. Have we heard anything about uh, the announcement yet? I have not. I haven't uh, looked at Twitter or <laughs> Facebook okay. or anything as yet. Just anxious. Yeah, Thank you. Else. Some people may have a chance while they're on to actually uh, look at their computers. I can add, if, if that's okay. Um, yes. What the minister announced for Grey County was that um, what we call the CMOG, which is the Municipal Operating Grant, it's something that we receive every year and it's um, almost like a cost recovery, if you will, for a portion of the, um, of the operating costs of the Grey Roots. Thank you. Thank you for the update. You're welcome. We're right. at 1120. Rob, uh, are we ready to go back live? Yep, I'm ready when you are. I think we have uh, Warden McQueen has joined oh, okay. us. Excellent. Then maybe uh, Mr. Warden, uh, if you're there, would you like to take over now? Just, uh, I'm just out in the parking lot and uh, I forgot my fob, but if somebody can let me in, I can set up on my desk. So uh, I'll, I'll let you carry on until I can get into my office. <laughs> Tara's on her way out to let you in. Okay, great. So I'm gonna, <laughs> Mr. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign off. So you carry on, Mr. Deputy Warden, you're doing it, I'm doing it um, as always. M Mr. Thank Chair, you. Dr. Eros here. I apologize uh, for some reason. I didn't have the invite when I checked for it at uh, 8.30, but later I noticed it's in my inbox emailed uh, at later time. Uh, I'm no, here. No. Thank you, Dr. Eros. Now, uh, perhaps, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I need your guidance here, but uh, uh, we did have a report um, uh, from the Board of Health. Uh, Councillor Patterson uh, did a nice uh, um, summary for us, uh, but I don't know if the council would permit me to, uh, while Dr. Era is here, if anyone has any questions and for the benefit of the public, perhaps as well, uh, Madam Clerk, would it be appropriate that I allow some uh, questions of uh, Dr. Era? I think um, if we would keep it short, then yes, I think we could certainly allow um, some quick questions of Dr. Era. Very good. Uh, so are we back live now, um, Rob? Yes, we are. Excellent, thank you, sir. Uh, so we will then entertain some questions if council has questions of Dr. Era. I see Councillor Soever's hand. Okay, Councillor Soever. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Era. And uh, I wanna express my appreciation to the health unit for doing such a great job on uh, following <clears throat> up um, and, and keeping the number of cases low. Um, we do have a number of cases that do pop up from time to time, which is to be expected. And, uh, but because we've had so few, I do notice that a lot of our citizens are um, getting very complacent and uh, in their attitudes towards uh, social distancing. And it's, it's a great concern that it um, creates issues. So I'm just wondering if it might be possible for the health unit to provide some information in a very generic way about how these new cases are getting into the community and what are the things that people should avoid doing. So I think if people understood that things like, I don't know how these cases are copping up, but I can surmise that it might be people having relatives visit them for the weekend because you know prolonged contact is one of the ways to, uh, you know, spread it. Um, but if we could maybe, is it possible for the health unit to identify where where these weaknesses are that uh, are letting uh, cases into our community and, and what we can do not to, you know, change our lives to be in prison or anything, but um, what we can do to um, mitigate those risks. Dr. Arrow? Is he muted? You're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I see three points in, in the question, two, two questions and, and in a third point. The first one is the source of cases. And uh, uh, some of these cases are, um, the, the risk is local, definitely. There's no uh, a risk factor for travel or for a visitor whatsoever. And that really speaks to the fact that there is community spread. 
Uh, other cases are, as you rightly said, uh, related to somebody visiting or a person is visiting another area coming back. And there is a handful of cases in the recent uh, months that, uh, that came from the United States, whether it's a Canadian coming back from uh, vacation or uh, uh, a person visiting their family and, and th there is a reason for them to cross the border and be here. Uh, regardless, uh, we look at the risk in, in our area, it's, it's not significantly different from other areas. We are in better standing, no question. However, is that, uh, um, is that enough difference to justify uh, dividing us versus them? Probably not. And uh, for many reasons, uh, we need to be careful with every interaction we have with another person, whether local or visitor, and we need to assume uh, it's, a, it's a safe assumption that each one of us is actually carrying the virus. And it, with that assumption, we will conduct ourselves in a way that's going to prevent uh, further transmission to other people and in the community. So th that's the first part. And your, your uh, note, can we provide more information about this? Too much communication is not enough with emergencies. So we definitely can put out uh, uh, some to that effect. Uh, social distancing and other risk mitigation that uh, people can can do uh, again we repeat and repeat and uh, uh, we will have to continue to repeat uh, the, the the advice uh, probably uh, three w's uh, looking at them the, 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 as a as a, a reminder or as a way to remember them uh, watching our distance the two meters ensuring it exists whenever we have the space uh, wearing a mask correctly and uh, washing our hands quite frequently with soap and water or hand sanitizer. These are the three things that got us through far with uh, a safe uh, reopening. And these are the three things that are going to continue to to help us going forward. And uh, the, the final point you mentioned is, is uh, uh, the, the um, uh, public being tired or fatigued from the interventions and the messaging about the interventions, two types of fatigue. This is to be expected, no, no question, uh, it will happen. Uh, we will continue again to, to provide that advice and your question in this council is actually a really good vehicle of communication to the whole public to know that we're still not out of the woods yet and we need to do our best to protect the most vulnerable of us. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Madam Clerk, anyone else? Councillor Millen and Councillor Potter. Okay, Councillor Millen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Warden. Um, Dr. Era, I note as of yesterday, we have 115 recovered cases in Graham Bruce. And I've had, you know, people say to me, well, it's almost like a, you know, a flu or a cold. Once you're recovered, it's all good. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there in your mind, uh, lingering effects that people should take this a little more serious than, than they are? Um, and do we have any indication of those 115? Uh, are there lingering effects of those uh, 115? So again, a very uh, good question. Lingering effect of COVID is to be uh, understood and learned as we go. Uh, by definition, the, the time frame, the window of time of our knowledge of this virus is seven months, eight months, is, is not enough to see long-term uh, effect. There are uh, studies to observe uh, for certain uh, uh, lung injury that is long-term, and there are some documents of it. However, we don't know if it's going to recover in nine months or a year. Um, the, the other two parts to the question, is this similar to the flu? No, it's not. It's actually 10 times, tenfold more severe than the flu from the numbers we're seeing about fatality rate. Fatality rate is the number of uh, death related to the number of cases. So after we classify people as, as cases, how many of them die? And, and it is sitting globally around five to, to seven percent. For the flu, it is 0 0.1 percent. So uh, there is a huge difference. And we know down the road when we have the antibodies test and we test for people who are infected and recovered, that fatality rate is going to go down by definition because the number of people 
in fact, it is going to be larger than we know right now. However, it's not going to go down to 0 0.1, similar to the flu. It's going to be at least 10 times more severe. And uh, the, the other part about uh, the, the uh, pandemic being different from the flu um, is the fact that none of us have immunity for it. The flu, uh, all of us had some type of uh, immunity, whether through a vaccine or through having the flu a couple times during our life. So the, the societal impact of the disease of the flu on the community is very similar to everything we see every year. There is a number of people get infected and the system can deal with it. However, with the pandemic being novel to the community and none of us have immunity to it, if you let it go through, uh, the number of people infected will be 100%. And the number who are going to use the system is going to be tremendous. It's going to break down the system. And that was the worry uh, before the first wave to see, can we control it with the measures we have? And we implemented everything we have. Uh, and, and we were pleasantly reassured after four months, after four weeks from the shutdown, that we have the ability to control it with all these measures that I mentioned, the three W's and few other things, uh, including uh, going to activities outdoors, avoiding crowds. Those five things are essential in our planning going forward. However, this is totally different from the flu, from the characteristic of the virus point of view and from the societal impact point of view. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Madam Clerk, I know that uh, we want to recognize Councillor Potter next, but uh, I don't see any other hands. To Council, I just want to say I want to be respectful of, um, this is a very important uh, uh, issue. Uh, but we also want to be respectful of the clerk's uh, guidance that uh, we've added this and we want to keep it brief. Uh, so, Councillor Potter. Thank you. I, I hope my answer, my question will be fairly brief, is, is that uh, how do we get across to people that it isn't Frankenstein and Dracula and the creature from the Black Lagoon that are spreading this? It's your coworker, your friend, your neighbor, somebody you you meet during the course of the day it's it's uh that's why it's so important that we wear masks not to protect ourselves because we are not chuck norris uh but to protect others and and that is you know when i see groups and we we talked last time about uh, a group that is having meetings and and events where they're promoting you know people showing up without masks and that kind of thing when I see that, I, I realize that a lot of people just are not getting the message. I, I think the answer is exactly the statement you made to make it short uh, for short time as well. It is n not a stranger. It's not uh, a monster who's uh, transmitting this disease. It's any one of us and each one of us could be could be the transmitter. Using mask or not is, is uh, again, an issue that, that controversial. In, in, in the media. However, in reality, we see over 90% of the public are doing the right thing. And whenever you see a, ma a person wearing a mask, it's a statement that I'm supporting the community. And when you see a person not wearing a mask, again, it's a statement that tells a lot about the person. Very good. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Aaron. Madam Clerk, I don't think I saw any other uh, hands. No, sir. So thank you, Dr. Aaron. We appreciate your time and, and your work. Thank you and I apologize again for being late for this meeting. No need. Okay, so I think this is the time to turn things over to our warden. Uh, I believe he's uh, on, on the call now. And uh, Mr. Warden, if you're there, we are at item 6B, uh, paramedic uh, response time plan uh, with um, Kevin McNabb on deck. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Warden. And, and again, thank you for the great job that you have uh, done this morning. And certainly um, the uh, announcement today by the Minister of Tourism was uh, certainly uh, well welcomed. Um, okay, so moving on to item six then, uh, Mr. McNabb, would you like to give your report, please? Oh, uh, moving, sorry, hang on here. Um, we have moved by Councillor Potter and second by Councillor Klumpus. I don't want my clerk getting upset at me. So, uh, Mr. McNabb, would you like to uh, speak to your report, please? So, uh, good morning, Warden and County Council. I'm just going to uh, share my screen.
Can you see that okay? Yep, yep, it's coming in clear here. Okay, so uh, for this report, uh, there's two recommendations. Uh, the first one that the uh, response time standard for 2021 be approved and be submitted to the Ministry of Health. And also that staff bring back a report to County Council prior to 2021 uh, budget deliberations of uh, looking at enhanced staffing to improve response times. So each year uh, we have to submit a report uh, to the ministry uh, that outlines the upcoming year response time standard. It's um, for the targets within the County of Gray. And then this one will be for the 2021 20, operational year. And uh, we do this under uh, regulation 257 part A for the response time performance standards. So the response time targets, there's uh, six, uh, six, or, um, six of them. Uh, the first one being for our response to cardiac arrest within six minutes. The ministry sets the time and we set the percentile. The second one uh, for uh, CTAS-1 patients, which is our most uh, critical urgent, is set at eight minutes and we set the percentile. And then for CTAS-2, 3, 4, and 5 patients, we set the time and the percentile that we'll respond in. So just a bit of an update of where we're at as far as response times go. Uh, in 2019, we met all targets except for CTAS-2. And that, that's been like that for uh, the last three to four years now. And uh, we're slightly under that area as well, but in other areas, we're meeting all those targets. In the last couple of years, we hadn't met in the cardiac arrest, but uh, those this year and last year, we met in that area as well. So um, meeting those targets, you can see the, the average over the last four years um, that, that they, we, we've been really doing really well as far as meeting the targets. And we're very close on the CTAS too. We also look at not just broken down by, uh, by CTAS levels, just to give an overall look as far as uh, nine times out of 10, how often we get there for all code fours instead of actually breaking them down by CTAS. And in uh, 2020, it's 15 minutes and 17 seconds. In 2019, it's 14.51. Keeping in mind the largest part of the winter, uh, January, February, March, uh, those, those uh, you know, it, may, it may, may decrease as the year goes on. We'll have uh, better weather, uh, in, depending upon what November, December are like. And our average response time is, is, is roughly comparable to last year. Uh, to June 30th, it's seven minutes, 59 seconds. And last year it was seven minutes and 43 seconds. You can see though, when you look at these calls, when people talk about average response time versus percentile response time, it, it, there, there is a, a big difference in how you measure that. Really, truly, it says nine times out of 10 or 9,000 calls out of 10,000 calls that we would be there in, in that amount of time versus taking every call and averaging it over, over the calls. So what we're recommending is to maintain the same targets for the 2021 year. And that would be that uh, for, for, for sudden cardiac arrest, which also would include an ambulance arriving or a community defibrillator on site would be 40% uh, of the time uh, at six minutes or less. Uh, CTAS-1, which is the life-threatening uh, calls that we would be there in eight minutes, 60% of the time or less. CTAS-2, which are our emergency calls, would be there in 15 minutes or less than 90% of the time. And CTAS-3, which is our urgent calls, would be there in 20 minutes or less, 90% of the time. And CTAS-4, which we consider less urgent, uh, 20 minutes or less, 90% of the time, and then the non-urgent uh, be there in 20 minutes or less, 90% of the time. Uh, these targets uh, have remained relatively the same other than in uh, 2016 uh, uh, that we reduced the, uh, the response time. Uh, it used to be 30 minutes, but we, because of performance, we went to 20 minutes. As far as emergency call volumes go, uh, this year we have seen a decrease in calls, uh, approximately 8.9% to June 30th. Across the province, we're seeing this. It looks like uh, COVID it limited some people from calling an ambulance. We, the call volume has been down. We don't know for sure if that's the reason, but it looks like it's been across the province. We've seen those decreases. But it is important to note that we do see annual increases over the last 10 years 
3.4% for code threes and 5.9% for code fours. When we developed these targets back in 2012, we were do, still doing a significant number of non-emergency calls. Our total call volume was 10,934 and uh, our non-emergency call volume was 2,796. And before that, we've even done over 4,000 non-emergency calls. But because of the rising call volumes, we've uh, increased our response to, uh, to emergency calls and uh, reduced our response abilities to non-emergency calls. So if you look at where we're at in 2019, we only did 237 on emergency calls. An emergency call volume was 11,681. For a total call volume, 11,918. In 2019, our call volume was approximately 1,000 calls more than when we developed the response time targets. So we're doing more calls now than what we were. In 2019, we, our, our increase in response, our calls was only 1.49%, but it's important to recognize in the last three years uh, added up, we, our call volume has increased 19% alone. So just in, in, in regards to this, this year we're less than we were less last year than we normally have been seeing in the last number of years. We just, uh, if they, we keep these yearly increases in call volumes, we'll have to look at additional resources or changes in targets or a different way of uh, delivering service. A bit about Chatsworth coverage. Um, in 2019, in January 19th, uh, the Chatsworth base went operational. Uh, it's covered by our community paramedic and also staffing out of Owen Sound when available uh, till noon. And then uh, from 12 to 12, we have a, a car book on there. Um, we, we use that car uh, quite regularly. Uh, it is used for coverage. It does get pulled back into, uh, um, into, Owen, into Owen Sound for calls, but we do our best to maintain coverage out at the Chatsworth location. In 2019, uh, in the Chatsworth municipality, there were 379 code 4s and 145 code 3s, which are code 4. Again, it gets kind of mixed up with CTAS, but that's our dispatch priority. Uh, code 4 calls are life and death, and code 3 calls are urgent calls. Uh, still emergencies, but not, uh, not, not really considered life threatening. We have seen improvements in the Chatsworth response time. Uh, overall, the, for code 4 calls, um, they've decreased by three minutes from uh, 2017 and during uh, staff time by four minutes and our average response time has dropped by two minutes. Since January 2019, we haven't really seen a lot of changes when we broke it down by CTAS uh, for this uh, sudden cardiac arrest and the, uh, um, and the CTAS ones. Um, those are the six and eight minute response times. Well, we have seen improvements, uh, CTAS two to CTAS five. Uh, so this kind of gives you a chart here of uh, explains of uh, our response times. You can see that from 2017, how we've reduced the, the 90th percentile on the average. And you, you can see where, where it's staffed and where we're providing coverage, where we have the additional car and and sound that we can move out there or community paramedics out there that uh, we reduce the response times. But at times when it's not staffed or covered by a community paramedic, the 90th percentile is higher and the same with the average response time. So uh, as far as uh, financial and resource implications, there's no immediate effect on budgets or staffing or legal information, uh, but uh, we, uh, we are looking at options to improve the response time and uh, we hope to bring a report uh, for future consideration uh, prior to budget to look at uh, different areas where we can look at, uh, at improving response times. So I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen there. Well, thank you very much for that report, uh, Kevin. Uh, very thorough as you normally do, and that's great. Uh, are there questions from county councillors? Mr. Warden, I have Councillor Potter and Millen. Okay, okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councillor Potter first, and then Councillor Millen. Councillor Potter. Okay. Thank you, Warden, and, and thank you, Kevin, for your report. Uh, I just noticed uh, a lot 
of times that the, I, I believe it's one of the cars from Meaford is, is over here in Thornbury, uh, probably uh, as a backup. And it seems like that has increased and maybe it's just my, uh, my perspective, but I, I just wonder if you have any notion that it has and whether we need to look at, uh, or, or whether you're looking at what's going on in this corner so that we're not leaving Meaford, Blue Mountains and, and other areas up here in north, the northeast corner of the, of the county short. So our, to you, Mr. Warden, our, our response times as far as uh, in, in those areas um, are, are remaining about the same. Our standby coverages are up. What you'll see when, when we're in uh, the, the vehicles in Thornberry, there could be two scenarios. Uh, one is, is that uh, Blue Mountains car is out and Meaford is in Thornberry covering or it could be the other way is where Meaford's out and, and Blue Mountain is covering. But also what happens and quite often is uh, 40, at least 40% of our call volume is in Owen Sound. So they actually get pulled over. So Meaford would go to Owen Sound and uh, and then uh, Blue Mountains would go to uh, uh, Thornberry. So that, that kind of moves the coverage across the top. Um, when we do have the additional car, we have a first response car and we also have an additional car in Owen Sound. It does work the other way though, where that car will go from Meaford, from, from Owen Sound to Meaford, and then Meaford will go to, uh, to Blue Mountain. So technically, well, all, what we try to do is we have eight base locations. We try to fill those base locations with a vehicle in each of those municipalities. And if we can't, then we, uh, we meet somewhere in, in the middle, like where we can reduce that response time that we cover off as best we can. So like, especially at night, we see these issues uh, where, where there happens um, once Chatsworth goes off um, at, at midnight is that uh, Meaford will be coming across and uh, Craig Leith will be sitting in, uh, in Thornberry. Okay, Councilor Potter. It probably depends on seasonal uh, items as well. Right. And like in, in the winter time in Blue Mountain, we actually send a lot of resources from Home Sound and all these other areas uh, to Blue Mountains because we could have you know, four calls happening there at a time. So we, we, it's a consistent uh, uh, movement. Like we, uh, you can see the screen behind me, we uh, monitor this all the time, where our vehicles are, what stage of the call they're on, who's available, who's coming available. It's, uh, it's all day long. It's not about really where the calls happening, we are concerned about that. It's about where coverage is coming from to ensure that if somebody else calls that they have a that have a reasonable response time. Right. Okay, thank you for that, Kevin. And uh, Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Kevin, uh, thank you for uh, the report. Very comprehensive as it always is. Question I have is, and it's a similar question I have every year. Um, and you alluded to, a, 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 you're asking for a staff report uh, to uh, enhance staffing. And I'm just wondering, are, you know, how does the county geography impact our response time? Um, you know, the response times in, in the charts that you gave in your report are uh, summarized from a, for across the county. But I'm sure there are some parts of the county geography that have higher response times than others. And will your report uh, make recommendations on how to fix those response times uh, because you know certainly there are parts of the county where if you have a heart attack it's a recovery mission it's not a it's not a help mission well we'll leave that to your quote Councillor Miller <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Kevin so yeah we we do look at all areas of the county and response time and and really in, in the county of Gray with being 4,500 square kilometers, mm -hmm. one, one base location as big as the whole city of Toronto. I used to work there, we have 120, 110 ambulances in 600 square uh, kilometers, where in Gray that could be one station area. So we, we are steady as far as our volume is concerned, but one of our biggest struggles in Gray is the area that we try to cover. And, and that, that's really one of the, the issues that we have is, is you know, when, when we lose vehicles to calls because they don't just happen one at a time, we can get three, four, or five calls at a time. And uh, covering that area, when that happens, that's when it starts to become difficult. 
and then you know and then also looking at the areas of the of the county that you know to look at for coverage whether it be in the, in the south uh east corner or in the middle in chatsworth or up in uh you know up um, along the georgian bay up in the couple beach area those are kind of things that, you know we'll look at in the report and uh bring information like that forward okay thank you very much and, and certainly my question was not meant to be critical by any stretch of the imagination you folks do a tremendous job and we all appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor uh, Millen for that. Um, any other uh, questions or comments? Councillor Mackey. Okay, go ahead then. Thanks, Madam Clerk. Councillor Mackey. Thank you, Warden. And uh, yes, thanks very much for the report, Kevin. Uh, certainly nice to see that the uh, response signs when we do uh, open up an additional station that uh, it has a positive respect on uh, uh, response times. Uh, I, just to follow up on what Councillor Mellon, uh, you know, was mentioning, it would be interesting to see, you know, in your staff report, uh, you know, where additional sites should be located to reduce the overall response time throughout the county. So certainly look forward to that. And uh, thanks for the report. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Councillor uh, Mackey. And, and you're right, uh, a life is a life doesn't, you know, response time is very important when it comes to cardiac arrest or those type of things. So we try to do our best in that sense, for sure. Other questions, comments from county councillors? Anybody out there, Madam Clerk? <clears throat> Nothing that I can see, Mr. Warden. Okay, so we see there's no other comments then. Uh, so the motion is uh, on the floor. It's been uh, moved by Councillor Hicks and, oh, sorry, Councillor Hicks and Councillor Woodbury. No, sorry, Councillor Potter and Councillor Clumpus. I apologize for that. Anybody opposed to that motion? Seeing none, that is carried. Okay, moving on. Uh, our next motion is moved by Councillor Hicks and Councillor Woodbury, and this is for the report CCRCWO620. And this is with regards to appointment to uh, a couple of our committees. And Madam Clerk, would you wish to uh, speak to that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, as Council will note from the agenda, or the report, there are two vacancies on two subcommittees that require uh, filling. One is the Climate Change Task Force, and the other is the CAO Performance Evaluation Committee. Um, each committee has one vacancy, so one position for each one to be filled. Uh, Councillors Potter, Mackey, Burley, and Soever have indicated their desire to be considered for the CAO Committee, while Councillors Hutchinson and Carlton have indicated their wish to stand for the Climate Change Task Force. Councillor Body had um, put his name forward, but has subsequently withdrawn that. And since the agenda was published, Councillor Desai has also um, indicated his interest in the CAO committee. Um, so the first thing I'm going to ask, I'm gonna go with the CAO committee. Is there anyone wishing to withdraw their name from that list? And that list is Councillors Burley, Desai, Mackey, Potter, and so ever. Anybody out there that uh, wishes to uh, denounce their name? Okay, Madam Clerk, oh, uh, Councillor Mackey. Yes, I'll certainly withdraw my name. There's lots of worthy candidates on the docket, so I'm fine stepping aside. Thank you. Well, thank you for that honorable uh, decision. Okay, okay. so thank any, you. anybody else? Madam Clerk, I'll leave it with you, sorry. No, okay. And for the uh, climate change, Councillor Carlton and Hutchinson, are either of you wishing to withdraw your name? Don't see any, okay. Is there anyone, oh, Councillor Hutchinson. Councillor Hutchinson. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I had to remember to unmute myself. I'll, I'll withdraw uh, if Councillor Carlton's interested in it, that's fine. Okay. Thank you very well, thank much. You again. Um, is there anyone, any council member wishing to have their name added to either the CAO committee for consideration or the climate change? Seeing none, then I can confirm that Councillor Carlton will be our member of the Climate Change Task Force. Um, as you know, Councillor Carlton, that task force is meeting this afternoon, so Rob Hatton will send you an invite. Thank you very much. Okay, for the CAO, yes. 
Um, for the CAO committee, then we have four members for one position. So we will require an election. Um, as we did before, I will ask um, each member in alphabetical order to provide brief comments on why they should be considered for this position. And this time we will vote using the raise hand feature. Everybody has uh, seemed really uh, well versed on it this morning. So uh, I think that's great. So we will start with Councillor Burley. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Clerk. Uh, I think I'm a great candidate for this uh, committee. I've, I've been around the horseshoe for a good number of years. I've seen a lot of uh, CAOs come and go. I think I have a vast experience when it comes to matters like this. So I think I'd make a great candidate. Thank you. Councillor Desai. I'll have to be very careful with what I say, lest councillor so ever take anything that I say as an endorsement of his uh, candidacy here. Um, but I, I'll, I'll point out that I, I've, uh, I have served on this very committee uh, in the past. Um, and uh, I think given that, uh, uh, given my experience on that committee, I would like to uh, go back on it. In addition, I've also been on the CAO Evaluation Committee at the lower uh, tier, and as well as I've uh, been on various evaluation committees in, uh, outside of uh, the municipal world. I think that uh, that strengthens my candidacy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Desai. Councillor Potter. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, I uh, have a lot of experience in, in municipal government, going back to my newspaper days, going back to the 70s, uh, watching various CAOs. Well, back in those days, they were usually called town managers or something of that nature. So I've watched a lot in various municipalities, including several of yours. Uh, I also, having been an employee of the town of the Blue Mountains back uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, I worked with the CAO at that time uh, I have been involved in evaluating our own CAO uh, for the past few years, and uh, I also am not currently on any uh, county committees uh, since my appointment back in uh, during the winter, so I would like the opportunity to uh, be involved in this way and share some of the workload. So uh, those are my, uh, my uh, qualifications, and I, I hope I can get your support. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Councillor Soever. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, um, I, I'm very interested in position. I was interested before, but being a first time mayor, uh, although I have a lot of experience in evaluating CEOs in private business, I was wanting to spend my time on learning the job of mayor. So I did not apply at first and deferred to Councillor Bertnicki at the time. Now that she unfortunately resigned, um, the position is open again. And I think we can bring my experience in evaluating CEOs to bear. I'd also point out that in the town of Blue Mountains, uh, since being elected, we have introduced a performance management plan for all senior staff. Uh, it's got the ringing endorsement of all the senior staff and the CAO. And, um, and it includes a bonus system and um, they're all very happy with that. And I'm also happy to report that in light of COVID, they voluntarily gave up their bonuses for this year in order to help the town meet the budget the shortfall from COVID. And we are implementing the plan this year in terms of performance management, but the bonuses will kick in next year at the request of staff. So that just goes to show that we did plan together. And I would hope that I can contribute at the county level just as successfully. Thank you, Councillor Soever. So we're going to go to a vote, but before I do that, are there any questions before we move to that? Seeing none. So we will be using the raise hand feature. We will again go in alphabetical order. So voting for Councillor Burley, please raise your hand. And you may vote for yourself. <laughs> Any other votes? 
I see two votes for Councillor Burley. Oh, I'm sorry. Three votes for Councillor Burley. Thank you. All right, Councillor Desai. Sorry, hang on a second. Oh, Tara's just resetting the votes, just a moment. Set? Okay. Councillor Desai. Any more for Councillor Desai? That is seven votes for Councillor Desai. We'll reset. Okay. Councillor Potter. Any more? That is five votes for Councillor Potter. Thank you, we've reset. Councillor Soever. Any more for Councillor Soever? Four for Councillor Soever. Councillor Desai has been elected to the CAO committee. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden, that's all I have. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk, and uh, congratulations to uh, Councillor Desai and congratulations to Councillor Carlton. Just, Madam Clerk, can you just add the other names that are on the CAO evaluation and on the other committee? with regards to the to, uh, to climate change, sorry. Um, sorry, I, I... Off the top of my head, um, Councillor's Body, um, Millen, and Hutchinson for the CAO. Along with the warden. Along with the warden. And I'm just going to... And that will include uh, climate Councillor Climate change. Desai. Yes, that will include Councillor Desai. And if I go to the climate change, that is uh, the warden, Councillor Desai, Woodbury, Hutchinson, Gamble, and Hicks. Great. And Carlton. And Carlton. Okay, thank you for that, Madam Clerk. And again, uh, uh, thanks for everybody stepping up and uh, wanting to serve on those committees. Okay, so then um, do we have any other discussion then with regards to that uh, motion that's on the floor that's including the two members? I see Councillor Hutchinson's hand up. Councillor Hutchinson, or Councillor Hutchinson, you can go ahead and speak there. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I just had a question. You just read off the uh, climate uh, control there. Oh, and, you and you're not on name, it. <laughs> you put my name on there, so. I was okay, I'm good. on the website and wanted... we'll have We'll have that corrected. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. I just wanted to Thank clarity you. on that. Thank you. And you can be an advisor, Councillor Hutchison. <laughs> that okay. I can do. I'll be, uh, I'll be on standby. Very good. Um, any other questions to that uh, resolution that's including those two names now? Any other question? Okay. And again, that was moved by Councillor Hicks and second by Councillor Woodbury. Is there anybody opposed to that resolution? All right, seeing none, that's carried. And now we'll move on to our next report, CCR CW 0720. And I have it moved by Councillor Robinson and second by Councillor Kibini. And I think Heather and Kim, you're going to speak to this report. That's right. Would you like me to start, Kim? Um, so this committee is uh, Moving forward following a notice of motion um, in which council endorsed the formation of the Agricultural Advisory Committee. Um, in order to have a starting point for the committee and determine appropriate outside stakeholders, um, a draft terms of reference uh, was completed and it was attached to the report uh, for your information. The draft terms of reference will be reviewed at the very first Agricultural Advisory Committee and any subsequent changes will be brought forward through those minutes for Council's consideration. 
Um, as far as membership, it's recommended that four members of council plus the warden, along with six agricultural representatives form the committee. Uh, the representatives would include a member from either of the three um, agricultural organizations in the county being Gray County Federation of Ag, uh, National Farmers Union or the Christian Farmers Union, a representative from Gray County Agricultural Services, a commercial livestock, grain or fruit and vegetable producer, an agricultural business supplier, an agritourism owner or operator, and a field to table rep. We thought that would provide a very broad um, uh, stakeholder involvement from uh, many areas of the agricultural sector. And of course, additional memberships or delegations from other um, agricultural stakeholders would be on an as required basis following discussions with the committee. Once the um, council membership is passed, then staff from a number of departments, including the clerks, economic development, uh, tourism and communications will work together to ensure that there's a widespread communication to the various stakeholder groups and communities related to the membership opportunities that this committee presents in order to look for volunteers who are interested in serving on this committee. Once the applications are received, a report will be brought back to Committee of the Whole for support of public stakeholders for the Agricultural Advisory Committee. Um, the following councillors have indicated their interest in this committee. Councillors Robinson, Woodbury, and so ever. Since the agenda was published, Councillor Keaveny has also indicated her interest. Um, so that is the four members plus the warden from uh, council. Is there anyone else at this particular time who is interested in putting their name forward for this committee? Seeing none. I'm looking to see if there are any questions from any member of council on the terms of reference or the report. And I don't know whether Kim, if you have anything to add um, to my comments or not. Madam CEO, do you have anything to add to uh, Heather's report there? You're on mute, Kim. Apologies, everyone. Only to ensure that council is clear. Um, we, we do have the Economic Development and Planning Advisory Committee. Um, we do have staff in economic development that are um, actively um, working in support of um, the agricultural sector and you know, through things like Ag 4.0. Uh, we anticipate that that work will continue on. Um, the Agriculture Advisory Committee's uh, mission and purpose um, is one of acting as the voice for the agricultural community at council and to coordinate and communicate between organizations back to council with regard to sector specific issues and or opportunities. So we will, in a sense, have um, two groups um, really focused on keeping a finger on the pulse of, of what the ag sector is 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 seeing and, and, and needing to be successful in the county. And Madam CEO, that's that's a good point you raise in the sense we need to communicate that very, very loudly in the sense of of how um, in depth Great County is with regards to agriculture, because that's a, it's a good news story in that sense, for sure. Mm -hmm. And thanks for raising that. Uh, any comments? I, I will say that the, the representative from field to table, I think is a good part in there because I think that ties in a little bit to the farmer's market and with regards to the consumer basis itself as well. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's a nice part of, in my opinion, uh, to add there. Okay, so the motion is on the floor. It includes the five Ms. representatives. Mr. Warden, sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Councillor Millen has a comment. Okay, sorry, Councillor Millen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Just a quick question to Kim in regards to uh, the role or the mandate of the, of the advisory committee. Uh, as I alluded to this morning in the debate about the, uh, the uh, OPA in Meaford, would that be a role for this uh, committee? Would they be consulted on something regarding that 
issue. Okay, I comments? Think, okay. Well, certainly um, through our normal pl planning um, practices and processes, um, there are also always um, public consultation opportunities um, where, where there are um, planning matters of, of significance. But in general, I, I think that you raise an excellent point, Councillor Milne, that um, if there was a, you know, if somebody wanted to bring forward this matter on a general basis to have a very specific discussion with the ag sector around these matters, I think that would be an interesting conversation and, and good information um, for all of us going forward. Thanks uh, for that comment, uh, Council Merlin. I think I picked up from what you're gathering there and that's, that's a good comment, I think, in the sense of having that avenue to uh, speak to that uniqueness, I think you're maybe mentioning. Okay, uh, any other comments? Uh, I'll Councilor give you an Potter. Okay, go ahead, Councilor Potter. Uh, yes, just to pick up on, on what Council Milne said. I, I think it's important that these kind of issues uh, be filtered through this Agriculture Advisory Committee. It's the reason to have it uh, because an Economic Development Committee is, is too general in scope to, uh, to realize uh, some of the more specific issues that affect the agricultural industry. So I, I think that as a matter of course, it would be great to have these sorts of things uh, filtered through the Ag Advisory Committee. Okay, thanks for those comments. Are there any other comments? I know, uh, Madam CEO, you mentioned uh, we received that letter, I think a couple of meetings back where it was with regards to uh, protein processing. And I think you, you suggested that that would be, when you would get correspondence like that, that would be a great opportunity to forward that off to this committee once they're up and running to sort of make those comments to what they feel on the, on the agricultural sector. And that's with regards to meat processing and, and that and, and that. So that could be one of their first agenda items, I presume. So. Okay, uh, no, other, uh, no other questions or comments there. And uh, again, that was uh, moved by Councillor Robinson and second by Councillor Keaveny. Uh, anybody opposed to that resolution? Okay, so that is carried. Uh, our next item is item uh, CAORCW1320, and this is moved by Councillor Hicks, second by Councillor Millen, and I think, Madam CEO, you're taking this uh, report? I am. Thanks, Mr. Warden and Council. If you've had an opportunity to um, review the, the substance of the report, I'll just give you kind of a high level um, overview. You'll recall that um, last February, when we had our budget discussion at Council, the Blue Mountain ratepayers um, provided a delegation to Council where they um, gave some information about. Um, um, their thoughts with regard to the county budget and also asked a number of questions. Staff approached um, the delegates after their delegation and offered to, to meet with them to try and explain and answer some additional questions. Um, it's unfortunate <laughs> that um, in the interim, uh, COVID happened and we weren't able to have that face-to-face -face meeting. Um, although I did attend um, the Blue Mountains budget meetings, their budget open house, and was prepared with information about the county's budget and to speak on items requiring clarification to anyone who attended that. Um, since that time, um, we've exchanged some correspondence with the Ratepayers Association. Some of it was very much a matter of, of fact and, and some specific numbers that they were looking for. Um, however, most recently in July, the letter that I had from them kind of started to get into more matters of what I would consider a policy or, or process. And uh, I indicated to them that I, I felt it was important that council be apprised of this and have an opportunity to give some direction to staff, which is why I'm bringing this forward. And so, wanted to um, make sure that it was clear to the rate payers uh, where and anyone else uh, where we are having to um, meet regulatory requirements um, and where we have some discretion. And 
as you know, if you looked at the correspondence, I think, I hope what, what comes comes clear out of that is that the county does a great deal of reporting uh, back to the province that the services that we deliver are services for the most part that we are required to deliver and the standards that we're held to are standards that are um, best practices and standards that the, the province requires of us. Um, many of our services are ones where um, we're working within a budget envelope that the province has provided. Um, and some of those uh, budget areas have seen um, decreases, especially on the administrative side of, of funding. And we've had to take action and, and manage our expenditures to stay within those budget envelopes. What I hope that we could get from this um, report today was any direction to me um, and then to the, to the rest of the staff, if council feels that um, there is a place for looking at alternate methods or significant expenditure reductions or any other direction around policy or procedure that you'd like to provide to me at this time, this is something that we can um, then start to work towards and be, a, be prepared to have a good discussion at our strategic planning session in October. So I will, I will leave it there and I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions that anyone would like to ask. Mr. Warden, you are on mute. It happens to the best of us. Thank you, Madam CAO. Um, I uh, thank you for those words. And I know that uh, with the announcement yesterday of the three, uh, $3 million with regards to our COVID-19 expense has helped a little bit of alleviating some of those concerns that are uh, that have had us this year. Saying that, uh, I'm going to open it up for uh, questions and comments from uh, County Council. I have Councillor Soever and Potter. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councillor Soever first. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, Yes, uh, our, as you can see from the correspondence, our, our stakeholders, our ratepayers are a very engaged group. Uh, for a number of years, they've been spending a lot of time on reviewing the town budget and, and subjecting uh, our town council and, and the budget process to scrutiny. Hence, our budget process is now four days. Um, and so, um, they're a fairly sophisticated group, uh, a lot of uh, former CEOs, vice presidents of large banks and things like that. So they understand budgets and spending. Um, I think their increased engagement at the county level is a healthy thing. Um, it's partly a consequence of disbanding the, the Town of Blue Mountains Task Force and the suggestion that upon the task force that matters should be brought to council and, and COW. So they, they took that to heart and, and it looks like that's what they're doing. They do tell me uh, their concerns, um, but they are independent. And um, certainly um, instead of uh, Councillor Potter and myself dealing with matters through the task force, we're happy to have them now dealing with some of the matters uh, because it takes a lot of responsibility off our shoulders. So. Um, the, some of the issues that you see there that they're particularly concerned about is some duplication in planning matters, uh, subdivision approvals and the like. Um, the, we obviously have a planning department here which they pay for through their municipal taxes and they are concerned that there's a bit of duplication there and they, they are interested in that. Um, one of the other matters you see there is the uh, fire communications. Um, they know that our, our fire chief has no concerns with our ability to communicate with our neighbors. And certainly we see that as very important. We did upgrade our radio frequencies and our system uh, a few years ago. So that was uh, done at great expense at the local level. And um, now, they're concerned we're being asked to pay for it again at the county level when we've already done it. Similarly, they've talked about, um, not in their letter, but to me about, um, you know, 
the aid we provide to others, which we, we have no problem doing, they, but they see similarities there where, um, you know, we, we have invested in equipment, um, which we regularly use um, outside our boundaries um, to help out other municipalities, which they don't have a problem with. But in light of the uh, radio communications uh, system, they are concerned that, um, you know, other neighboring municipalities perhaps are lagging a bit behind in, in equipping and um, their first responders with the appropriate training and, and um, equipment. So um, they're concerned about what the effects of that will be in the future. So it is, it is a long list and um, I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's good that they're involved because I'm sure with their focus on the county now, um, as a result of the disbanding of the Blue Mountains Task Force, uh, that people in our community are becoming much more aware that we are part of a county. Um, and so that is a positive. Um, obviously, it's going to require our attention. And um, so that's what we're here to do. And that's really all I have to say. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Councillor Swever. And Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you. And I think uh, Councillor Swever covered a lot of the ground, but uh, I do point your attention to the questions regarding reinvestment and infrastructure. Uh, we, I know that everybody is seeing increased traffic. I doubt they're seeing what we're seeing and dealing with some of the things that we're dealing with. Uh, and maybe it's because of COVID, maybe it's because of other things. We know, for example, that we're going to see population growth here because more and more people are looking at moving here full time. We're seeing more, more children, for example, enrolling at our local school. So we are going to have to be dealing with these things and our residents are, uh, are concerned about them. So are we, of course, but they want to know that we're, that the county is on us. Uh, this traffic, for example, on our roads is not only coming to the Blue Mountains, it's coming, as I'm sure Councillor Desai would want to remind me, it's coming through Grey Highlands, it's coming through Chatsworth, through Meaford, and of course through our neighboring Simcoe County. So we have to deal with this and the county has to be a full partner and has to look very carefully at, uh, at whether, uh, whether we're assigning enough uh, priority to dealing with the situations that are arising with traffic through our area. So I think with that, I'll leave it, but I, I thank Councillor uh, Swever for his comments earlier as well. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Councillor Potter. Other comments from County Councillors? Councillor Desai. Go ahead, Councillor Desai. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I'm, I'm actually very happy that uh, Councillor Potter takes what I say to heart. Uh, I'm, I'm very impressed. I would also like to point out, uh, Mr. Warden, um, that the last time that there were um, uh, delegate, there was a delegation from the Rapers and the Town of Blue Mountains. They were also looking for the county to invest in uh, things such as uh, recreation. We've repeatedly seen that there is a lack of investment in the town of Blue Mountains, not just from the county, if, if in fact the county does underinvest there, but also on the township's own side. I think I'd, I'd also like to go back to when we discussed our county budget last year, and I did request that we uh, look at adding more money to the budget uh, for asset management and other such uh, opportunities. And if I remember correctly, the members from the town of Blue Mountains we're not supportive of that. And um, so I think for too long as a council, not and this is not just county, not just the town of Blue Mountains, but as councils in general, we have, um, we, we have put the uh, need to have a lower tax rate over the, the need to have proper working infrastructure and proper investments in infrastructure. So um, while I can appreciate the, um, um, the, the correspondence that we've received at the same time, I also think that it's not something that's going to be fixed in one, one term of council. It's also not something that's going to be fixed just by the county making more investments in the town of Blue Mountains. It's something that's going to need change 
at the county as well as at uh, local uh, municipal uh, levels. Um, and a lot of that will probably come from education that um, maybe the budgets do need to be a little higher at some point. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Desai, and I uh, hope you and Mr. Potter get along very well. Uh, any other questions? We, we've got matching masks, I think. Oh, well, I, 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 I'm not going to go there. <laughs> uh, has a sub or Councillor Soever, I'm sorry, has a subsequent. Okay, just before I go to Councillor Soever, is there anybody else that wants to speak first? I hear none. Councillor Soever, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Councillor Soever, you're on mute. No, yeah, I saw that. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, yes, and, and I want to thank uh, Councillor Desai for his comments, and, and I will agree with him. There has been underspend in a number of areas, and, um, you know, there and, and councils in the past have not spent. We are doing a new leisure activities plan. Um, certainly, we, we do not spend, uh, I've looked at it um, as much on recreation as, as some of the neighboring municipalities. Um, pe some people say we have a low tax rate, but people have to realize if you have a small wood frame house here, and I know the former uh, warden and, and, and the current warden have seen these little homes on our main street that are worth $600,000 which might be in, in Hanover or any of the other municipalities worth $300,000. These people pay twice in county taxes what they do in other communities, which impairs our ability to raise taxes at the local level. Because if you're a retired person who's lived here for 50 years, and through no fault of your home own, your house is now worth $600,000, and your county tax bill is twice what it would be in any other part of Gray County, um, you cannot afford to pay as much in local taxes just because your assessment is high. Our tax rate might be low, but the dollar number for these individuals on a, on a limited income is, is very, very high. And so we have to weigh that. And certainly I would like to spend much more at the local level um, to provide some of these things that Councillor Desai talks about. But this, and it's no one's fault. It's just the structure and what's happened with the market. But the, the tax structure has put us in a place where um, our, our taxes may not be high on a rate number, but in a dollar number on a home of similar quality are hugely different. They're more than double at the county level what they are anywhere else in Gray County. So this is, this is a councillor decides right. We aren't spending enough. And what we can do to collect that money to spend enough, well, that's what we're struggling with. Okay, thank you for those comments, councillor uh, Suever. Other comments? I see councillor uh, Desai has a subsequent. I don't think there's anyone else that I see, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. Councillor Desai, you have a secondary question. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. Um, so I agree with Councillor Sarver. Uh, at the same time, we do have to realize that Town of Blue Mountains uh, pays per $100 of assessment, the same as every other municipality, I would imagine, or I would hope so, unless there's a, a definite agenda against Town of Blue Mountains. Um, I agree with him that it's, no, it's through no fault of the resident that uh, their house is now worth six hundred thousand dollars. Is it a fault of how we tax property? Maybe that's a different topic and a different question, though. So, just, just, just hang on, Council. Decide. Can somebody put their computer on mute? There seems to be some sound coming through there. I don't know where it's coming from. Sorry about that, Council. Decide. I want to make sure everybody can hear you. Go ahead. It's gone away now. Sorry. Yeah. So I think it's um, you know, if it, it, it could be a, it could possibly be an issue with. Uh, uh, how we tax property, and that's fine. We can have that discussion, but I don't think uh, this is the right time for that discussion. Uh, uh, well, certainly, I think we're the idea of the report is the some of these items can be spoke at our, our st strategic planning meeting that we're planning in October. Uh, some of the core reports of that debate, and and that could be further discussed at that time. So these are good conversations that we're having 
today on those points. And thank you for that, Councilor Desai. Uh, are there any other comments or questions with regards to the uh, Madam CEO's report? <clears throat> So, Madam CEO, you were looking for a little bit of direction. I thought I caught that in your your deputation to your report. That you is there further direction you need for your report before I go to Councillor Millen. I just want to get that comment back from the CAO. Oh, thanks, Mr. Warren. I think what I will do in in preparation for the strategic planning session in October, um, I will have a discussion with um, the CAO committee. Hopefully we can get a meeting set up for that in early October. And as well, I'll survey all of council. And that way, if people have ideas of, of what they'd like to see on that agenda, there'll be an opportunity for, to, for them to bring those forward at that time. And maybe I can meet with you as well. I know I had one-on-ones with... Uh... Uh, all county councillors except Councillor Robinson it just didn't hook up with COVID-19. I can maybe share some of those points that were raised much earlier this year. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and uh, Councillor Robinson, you and I can still have that last one-on-one. -on -one. We will do that. Councillor Millen, I think you had shown you wish to speak. Just real quickly, uh, I, I wanted to indicate the two uh, CAO Wingrove that I think the process that we, we've used in the past has worked very well. There's always been a very uh, in-depth, uh, engaged conversation about what we want to do, where we want to go, how we want to do it. Uh, our senior staff are always really good at coming up with new ideas on how we could do something different if need be. Um, so I look forward to the discussion at the strategic planning event. Okay, thank, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Millen. And Madam CEO or Madam Clerk, what was the date on that? I don't have, I can't pull my calendar up, so. October 15th. Sorry? October 15th. October 15th. So that'll be just after Thanksgiving, correct? I, I presume. Okay, thank you for that. Any last comments to the report? Uh, moving forward to the uh, Councillor Hicks, Deputy Ward. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I just want to compliment the staff. Uh, you can see from this report uh, a significant amount of uh, a time and work, um, you know, patience <laughs> has gone in uh, uh, to this uh, portfolio, and I think they need to be complimented for that. Okay, well, thank you for those comments, uh, Deputy Warden, Councillor Hicks, and uh, yeah, we we need to always give our gratitude for all the hard work our staff do do for sure. Okay, uh, seeing there's no other questions or comments. Um, so it was moved by Councillor Hicks, second by Councillor Millen. Are there anybody opposed to this motion? Seeing none, that is carried. Okay, that is done. So um, going back by memory, uh, th at this time, Madam Clerk, uh, was there anything pulled from the consent agenda? Yes, Mr. Warden. Um, Councillor Soever requested that item G, the affordable housing task force minutes from July be pulled. So we'll need to have those moved and seconded. Okay, so Councilor Soever, do you wish to move those? Yes. Okay, do we have a seconder? Madam Clerk, you see somebody there? Councilor Potter? I, I, I just saw a hand there, so. Okay, so um, so those yes, are- that, Yes, Warden, that was me. Yeah, okay, so that is on the floor. So I'm gonna go to Councilor Soever, so you can now speak to that. Uh, that item. Yes, uh, I'm very pleased that we were able to have the meeting of the Affordable Housing Task Force. And you'll see the minutes of, of that, which, which we just pulled. And um, just wanted to bring Council's attention to the, um, the draw that the we are being asked to approve that um, the draft action plan um, become the and be worked on as for developing the uh, terms of reference for the task force. And there's three points right toward the end of the, uh, the minutes there that I think are fundamental uh, to the um, mandate, um, as well as of course, the items uh, brought forth in the action plan. Um, those three items at the back are um, looking at um, any action plan that's developed and with the, well, any terms of reference that are developed with respect to the action plan, um, of course, need 
to take into account where the financing is going to come for, for these projects um, and who uh, these the target audience is. So you can see that in the minutes, uh, the, the paragraph at the bottom of the, uh, the second last page talks about, um, you know, having something sustainable that can finance itself or is there to have something that requires county funds in the budget every year. And obviously there's no sense of spending a couple of years working on putting together an action plan and bringing it to council and council then says, well, we don't, we don't want to finance this. Um, this plan's no good because it has to be self-financed. This plan isn't. So I think that's fundamental. The other thing which we've struggled with in the town of Blue Mountains is to determine who the target audience is. And that's the second last paragraph. Um, we already do do social housing at the county. So here in the town of Blue Mountains, we're targeting not those people that the county is serving already. Um, we are targeting the missing middle. So those are people with an income between 40 and 100,000 that are priced out of the town of the Blue Mountains market. Um, so the, it, is, it is careful, it, we do need to be careful in the um, mandate of the committee is to identify, um, are we, is this committee going to just augment what we're already doing in housing for the same audience? Or is it going to target the missing middle? Um, you know, people that need an entry level home but can't afford it on an average salary or even a better than average salary. Like when you're looking at $600,000 for a starter home, um, you know, that means that's the target that we're trying to serve with our attainable housing. So I think it's also important that we don't get duplication with over serving a segment of the population by having local municipalities and the county do it at the same time. And, and to that end, uh, you know, the last paragraph, you know, talks about, um, you know, both of those subjects, because um, it does actually say that um, most successful developments are a mix of affordable rent geared to income and market rent units. So if we are targeting something that is sustainable and doesn't require the county to put in millions of dollars every year, then we do need to plan for developments that can sustain themselves. And that will mean that you'll have to include in the development either some more expensive units for sale or maybe some commercial space, which if needed in a community can be a, a good driver for economic development as well. So <clears throat> I just wanted to pull this item to highlight that as council, when we give direction on the mandate that we consider these items um, as well as the action plan so that we ask staff to write that into the mandate. So the committee doesn't do a lot of work and it comes to council and council says, well, you're not serving the right people and we don't want to spend $4 million a year. So take your plan and go back and start again. Well, thank you for those comments and and certainly i think the part of, a, of attainable the ability to build a afford or live someplace where you can and, and i think that is part of that mandate uh mayor Sorber, in the sense of, of the ability to live work and play in gray county to, you know wherever you are in the sense right mr warden i do have councillor desai okay councillor desai you're next welcome come on thank you thank you mr warden um I, well, first of all, I'd like to ca ca commend the town of Blue Mountains uh, for for taking the step with their affordable housing uh, uh, projects there. Um, one of the very interesting things that Councillor Sauver mentioned uh, was with regards to having units that are affordable for the messy middle or the, basically mm -hmm. the people who are earning between forty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, and I, I think it's important that we recognize uh, that messy middle because our, our economy here has been built on, on the middle class thriving. And 
my question to you, Mr. Wharton, to Councillor Sever, and maybe it's a premature question, is uh, do they have a plan on how they're going to st sort of control the, uh, the price on, on such houses, um, if there are any houses, or are they planning on them, on them being rental units only? Thank you. So those are good questions that we need to tease out further of our committee for sure. And, and it is that challenge with regards to the cost of housing. And we know it keeps going one direction and that is up and that's uh, is an issue with regards to affordability for sure. Um, I don't know if any, Kim or anybody else like to make a comment on that or, or Anne-Marie or, or others on the committee. Um, this is sort of a new task force that we're putting in play and there's the recommendations are that are there to start off with any comments from anybody else uh, maybe to address and and as i said maybe it's a premature question and and it's something they can uh, consider uh during their deliberations okay thank you i think madam ceo i thought i heard your voice there is that correct thank you um i think we do we do have a couple of pieces of work that um in some ways we'll end up coming together to try to add to the to the our thoughts and our discussion here um, when we look at the work that of the upcoming owen sound and hanover task force i think um, housing issues um, and security of housing issues are things that may come forward in that discussion i think i would feel um, that i hadn't done my job if i didn't remind council we have a waiting list for affordable housing in the county of Gray that exceeds 750 people or families. And these are people who have nowhere to live. So I think, um, you know, we do need to have another discussion perhaps at the next meeting of this task force mm -hmm. to be very clear about um, where it is that we are going to put scarce resources and um, what the impact of investments that the county can make or facilitate will be both for the most vulnerable people in our communities, but also to the economy as a whole. Okay, yeah, thank you for that, Kim, and uh, we can get lots of conversation. I know there's young people, there's first time buyers, there's people that are, I think there's called the working poor that's even out there that uh, are making minimum wage and, and can't find a place to find accommodation. And maybe that's part of what you're talking, Madam CEO, with regards to those people that can't find accommodations. And so, yeah, we'll have lots of more conversation with regards to uh, the affordability of homes for sure. And rentals is, is very, very much in, in, in demand as, as Anne Marie had brought forward at that meeting. So any other Comments. I mean, that was our first real meeting, so you know. Mr. Uh, Warden, I have Councillor Soever who'd like to provide some final comments. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councillor Soever. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and um, I thank uh, Councillor Desai and and, and the, the Madam CEO for their comments. And that's exactly what I was wanting to address by raising these points. Mm -hmm. Is we need to focus on who we're trying to serve with this and, and how it fits with what we're already doing. I know we can always do more. Um, the thing is when you serve a population that is that is in the kind of missing middle, you, can, you do have a hope of making it uh, self-sustaining because these are the working poor or you know almost poor. So, you know, what we've said at the town of Blue Mountains, our minimum threshold for getting in at 40,000 of income for the family. So this could be two people making 20,000. But anyway, I understand that the Blue Mountain Sustainable Housing Corporation has applied to come and, and, for, and make a presentation as to what we're doing later in the fall. So I'll just wind up with that. And I think we have addressed many of these issues here in, in trying to pick a target market that is both, um, you know, can fund a sustainable project and, and then you need to also look at how you do fund the homeless, but obviously they're not in a situation to, to do that without substantial government assistance. So um, those are important questions and I'm glad that we will be considering those. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? I know for 
there used to be a program out there for first time buyers that you could save on the uh, land transfer tax. I'm not sure if that program is, is still out there, but you know, I, maybe there's other incentives that we as the County of Grey could look at. Maybe it's through when we, we do our development charge or other things. Uh, I know in Grey Highlands, we've, re we've reduced our minimum size. We've taken it right off. So if there's an opportunity for a, a smaller home that could be built. Maybe that ties into our development charge. If you're building a smaller, smaller unit, it has a different rate than or a less rate. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics that we can do that, you know, that uh, are incentives as well. So, OK, so that's going to be coming forward to our next meeting. And those minutes are there and uh, the recommendations that uh, come out of those minutes. Uh, any last comments to to that report? And uh, seeing that. OK. Uh, well, is there anybody opposed to that resolution that was on the consent agenda that was pulled up forward? Hearing none, that is carried. Okay, so that's uh, that takes care, I think, of everything, Madam Clerk. That takes care of everything on the agenda, is that correct? I guess the um, question- Go Kim ahead. is going to speak to the AMO delegation confirmations. Okay, very good. Okay, Madam CEO. Uh, Exciting times, a whole different, exciting uh, AMO conference. I was speaking to Penny this morning and she was saying she was reviewing the process of, of signing into AMO, which we, she recommends that I and others do watch to get the, 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 the particulars of, of, of signing in there. And I understand also we have um, Councilor Robinson, you're running for, I think, Roma as a representative and I think uh, Councillor Sampson from the mountains is running for OSOM. So good luck to those individuals too. Madam CEO. Thanks, Mr. Ward. And so just to confirm with council, um, we did secure delegations with um, uh, the OMAFRA parliamentary assistant, Randy Petapis to speak to uh, additional broadband funding. Um, Minister Mulrooney from MTO with regard to regional transportation and also with Minister Fullerton uh, with regard to long-term care and, and funding there. Um, just to echo the warden's comments, this is a first time with this online conference and the access to the delegations is a little more complex probably than anybody wants. So, and also I know that they're gonna be just as strict as they always are about time. So I really encourage people make sure if you're part of these delegations that you've got um, the information at your fingertips and you're able to get in there on time because they are being very strict about it. Okay, thanks everyone. Well, thank you, Madam CEO. And that's probably good to sign in at least five or 10 minutes beforehand. And I understand that the province is gonna be sending out those links for those delegations to sign in. So yeah, cordial and, and prompt will be very important. And. Uh, and I guess, uh, Madam CEO, we'll speak about the leads and who's speaking to which and how we're doing that. Okay, you and I can have that talk. And I think Councilor Robinson, uh, who who else is, uh, I did have the list, uh, uh, who else is, is is being part of those delegations? I think Councilor Soever, you are, are you not yeah. Councilor Woodbury? Councilor Woodbury. Um, so there's a few that's going to be, Councilor Clumpus, okay, great. And I'm not seeing any who else is, but uh, certainly uh, I, I think, uh, Councillor X is also. So I think just uh, to our um, next agenda, I think Madam Clerk coming in um, September, maybe there would be a good opportunity to add a little spot so we could, so those that have been part of those delegations or as part of AIMO, we can talk a little bit about what we learned and we can share back um, our responses or any communication so we can certainly inform those that uh, weren't part of the delegation or part of AIMO and uh, Certainly anything I receive or others that we, we forward that to the clerk for information or it can be shared. I think it's always good that uh, there is a cost to go into this as well, but it's always good if we can share it to other county councilors information. That's very important for sure. Okay, Madam Clerk, Mr. is there anything? Yes. I have um, Councilor Soever and Councilor Clumpus that have questions. Okay, Councilor Soever first and Councilor Clumpus. Yes, um, when, when will we know the exact times? my uh, deputy clerk yesterday and she still hadn't received anything um, on timing because uh, we do have three from the town of Blue Mountains and I want to be able to make sure that I coordinate my schedule. Um, so is it the sooner we can I, under I understood that 
that Penny had forwarded those those appointments out to to everyone. I will double check that 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 has happened, but I think I was CC'd on all of them. So we'll just okay. make sure that that's gone out. Um, there's two things that happen. One is the appointment itself, but then there's the second part is the actual details of how to log into the Zoom call. Yeah. And yeah. those aren't out yet. Right. Okay, thank you. And I think they're going to forward those closer to the time. Yes. Right, so, okay. Uh, 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 Councillor Clumpus, you're next there. Yes, thank you, Dep uh, Mr. Warden. I, I was just uh, curious because we had missed a, um, an, the AMO webinar this morning at, uh, at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, with how to access and how to get into the conference itself and all of that instruction. Um, I'm wondering if there's some way that we can uh, have a repeat of that and, uh, and, and make sure that we're all tuned in. So I spoke to Penny uh, just before I came on to County Council and she said that she was viewing it and she was going to look at forwarding it to all of County Council or, or the link to that. So at least we can get that information. And she highly, highly recommended we all watch it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for raising that. Okay. Council. Sorry, Councillor Millen, is that next? Yeah, just, just for clarification, yeah. are the delegations to the ministers open to all the delegates to AMO or just to those that were invited? So I think there's two parts, uh, Councillor Millen. There's the delegation requests, which I think will be by the names that have made those delegation requests from each minister. But there is also those forums that if you're assigned into the AMO conference, you will be able to be part of those. I think there's three different, you know, they call it the bear pit sessions, but they're each day there's so many ministers that are available so that's that's a separate part but i think that's more open right and I, no i was just i was meaning more directly the delegations that we received from individual ministers or ministries are those open to all of the delegates from gray county that are registered or just to those counselors that have been invited to participate so madam ceo can you speak we, to that we, at all? Um, we had communicated to the province the, the counselors that we knew who were interested in being part of a delegation and that was done a little while ago. If somebody wants to be added to one of the delegations, we, we can certainly try and communicate with the province again that we want to add somebody so that they can get, um, the, the, they know that they're on the list and they can get yeah. the information out to them about how to log in. So Councillor Millen, were you, are you attending AMO? I'm registered for AMO, that's correct. And are you on all the delegations or? or, or no. what you, oh, okay. So Madam CEO, can you maybe send out a, a new list to make sure we know or you know who's all attending from Gray County and if they wish to be added? I will have, Penny has sent out um, appointments, but I will have her send the list out again to everyone so people Great. know who and what, okay? Thank okay. you. You're welcome, Councillor Millen. And that goes for everybody if you are going and, and not only from the county's uh, uh, registry, but from the uh, lower tier as well. You're still part, you're still county councillors and, and it's important that uh, you're part of uh, the big picture for sure. Madam Clerk, is there anybody else that's out there? No, sir. Okay, so any other business in of uh, county council? Seeing none, uh, I have it moved by Councillor O'Leary and Councillor Hicks yes. uh, to adjourn. Mr. Warden, you missed notice of motion, so I don't oh. know if there's any notices of motion. I apologize for that. I don't have my agenda up in front of me right at the moment. So are there any notice of motions? And our next meeting is not till September 10th. 10th. So are there any notice of motions for, for upcoming meetings? Okay, I hear none. And I guess uh, 10 days prior, uh, Madam Clerk, they can... Yeah, I have Councillor Desai. Councillor Desai. Yep. Uh, sorry. So uh, I just wanted to give an update. I, we, we had had a bit of a conversation two meetings ago on one of my uh, proposed notices of motion. Um, I just wanted the county council to know that I have since had a meeting with um, uh, the CAO and the director for transportation. And um, 
uh, my concerns have been addressed and I've, I've been told that the concerns will be coming forward in a, in a uh, report uh, at a future meeting. So uh, I just wanted to thank the CAO and the uh, director for uh, transportation uh, for working with me on that. Thank you. Okay, and, and thanks uh, for pointing that out, uh, Councillor uh, Desai, and, and thanks again for staff for reaching out to her, the uh, councillor. Mr. Warden, I have Councillor Hicks as well. Okay, Councillor Hicks. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Warden. I don't have a notice of motion, but uh, I'm just uh, reminding everyone about climate change uh, directly after this meeting. Will it be directly or do we want to set a time? I think we'll set a time, Kim, 1.30, 1.45. Are we okay um, with are we okay with 130? Can that work for people? Do you need an extra few minutes? I'm seeing uh nods, I'm seeing nods, nods for 130. 130. Yeah, and I think Rob Rob sent out an invite or he's going Correct. to send it. Okay, so that, that works. Um okay. Seeing there's no other business as before, I want to thank everybody and, and hope everybody's having a great summer. And enjoy this great summer that we are having. It's, uh, I, I'd say it's almost next to none. Uh, Councillor Millen, the crops are growing, the pastures for the cows, and uh, I'm sure coming off the fields in a great manner. <laughs> so uh, it's great to see. So enjoy it, because you know we get eight months of winter. So, <laughs> which works works for the town of the mountains. That's good, and it keeps the revenue and the and the generator there. So, at this time, I'm going to. Uh, is there anybody opposed to adjourning? Nobody opposes that. That's carried. Well, again, thank you, everyone. And uh, bye, everyone. See you guys. Bye. bye, -bye. And Madam Clerk, I'm going to.